Amada Shiro was a mere employee at a company, bored with his monotonous life as a salaried worker. Deciding to quit his job, he moved back to his grandmother's house. Upon opening a storage room door, he discovered a pathway to another world. Disbelieving his eyes, Shiro gently closed the door, convinced he was just dizzy from overworking and imagining things. Sighing deeply, he placed his hand on the doorknob and opened it again, his mouth agape in astonishment at the forest before him. Could this be the secret his grandmother mentioned seven years ago? Shiro's grandmother had disappeared seven years prior and was officially declared deceased last month. This was also why he had abandoned city life to return to the countryside, intending to farm and fish. Rushing back inside to his grandmother's portrait, Shiro found a letter next to it, addressed to him. In the letter, his grandmother spoke of an old secret, highlighting six important points. First, a wardrobe that connects to a world named Rufarsho. Second, the existence of magic, spells, and strange forms of sorcery there. Third, dangerous monsters in Rufarsho. Fourth, various species and humans coexisting in that world. Fifth, a ring left in the envelope by his grandmother that would allow him to understand the language of that world. Lastly, the sixth point urged him to wear the ring and read the book in the cupboard. Shiro collapsed to the floor, overwhelmed by the barrage of information. After digesting it all, he opened the two books mentioned by his grandmother. Inside were dense lines of text he couldn't comprehend. Remembering his grandmother's instructions, Shiro quickly put on the ring. Although he could now read the words, stringing them together still made no sense to him. A voice in his head announced he had acquired a skill for equivalent exchange, startling Shiro into falling to the ground. Confused about whether his experience was akin to a novel or a game, the voice spoke again. Shiro had gained a skill in collection, realizing that the voice would speak whenever he acquired something new. After finishing the books, Shiro was uncertain whether to venture into this new world with his newfound abilities. Considering it was already late, he decided to set off the next day, planning to buy some supplies first. The next morning, Shiro stood before his grandmother's altar, praying for her guidance and company. Then, with a large bag in hand, he stepped through the wardrobe door. Arriving at a bustling urban area, after half a day's walk, Shiro's stomach relentlessly growled, leaving him no choice but to slow down. Sensing a customer's need, a vendor enthusiastically advertised his grilled rabbit meat, priced at only three coins. Unfortunately, Shiro had no local currency, and with a rumbling stomach, he inquired about the price before walking away, disappointed. Overhearing people behind him praising the delicious aroma of the grilled rabbit, Shiro couldn't help but salivate. Regretfully unable to taste the food, he looked up to the sky in frustration, pulling out 42,000 yen from his Japanese leftovers. Suddenly, the yen transformed into a series of coins of different denominations in Shiro's hand. Disbelieving the occurrence, he rushed back to the vendor, holding up the coins to confirm their validity. The vendor, though looking at him like a fool, guessed that Shiro might be from another country and smiled kindly. Realizing this was the skill of equivalent exchange in action, Shiro immediately ordered three skewers of meat, receiving a discount of one coin. Eating, he silently thanked the vendor's generosity. The food, his first meal in this new world, tasted bland, akin to the dull emotions of an ex-lover, utterly flavorless. Wondering about the money he had just exchanged, he contemplated if the skill could also convert back to Japanese yen. To his surprise, when he activated the skill again, the foreign coins turned back into yen. Elated, he realized this skill allowed him to exchange currency in any world. Contemplating the riches he could amass here and convert back in Japan, he tested by converting 10,000 yen, which resulted in a single silver coin. One coin was equivalent to 100 yen, and a silver coin equated to 10,000 yen. Thus, he had two silver coins and 34 regular coins. Seeing one of Shiro's silver coins, the vendor shook his head in dismay, his shop not big enough to trade for that amount. Unperturbed, Shiro stood up, shouldered his backpack, and walked away. Observing the vendor's reaction, Shiro guessed that the money he had could let him freely explore the town. Walking through a narrow alley to a main street, he was delighted to discover a variety of faces, even a girl with cat ears. Feeling the curious stares of people around him, Shiro checked his own clothes when suddenly a little girl carrying flowers approached him. She turned out to be a schoolgirl wanting to sell flowers for three coins each, 
but upon seeing Shiro's hesitation, she reduced the price to two, then to one coin. Without much ado, Shiro picked a yellow flower and paid the initial price of three coins. The girl, surprised, agreed to Shiro's condition of answering his questions. Her name was Aina, and the two introduced themselves. Through Aina, Shiro learned useful information, the town was part of Jiluam Kingdom's Nino Rich district. There were three currency units, 100 coins equaled one silver coin, and 100 silver coins made one gold coin, making a gold coin worth a million yen. The average monthly income of locals was about eight silver coins, and only a few city dwellers owned gold coins. To trade in the town, one must negotiate with the local authorities first. Shiro decided to buy ten more flowers from Aina, leaving her astonished but grateful as she accepted the thirty coins and thanked him. Following Aina's guidance, they went to the local government office. Upon arrival, Shiro felt nervous, being a foreigner and uncertain about potential difficulties. As expected, meeting the manager made Shiro extremely anxious. She handed him a paper to fill out his name, business hours, and type of goods, then suggested he could be a street vendor, a retailer, or a shop owner. Shiro promptly chose to be a retailer for five days at the rate of ten coins a day, equivalent to one thousand yen. He muttered to himself that it was cheaper than Tokyo's market rate of three thousand yen per day and quickly covered his mouth. Hearing this, the manager smiled and mentioned that it was a rate set by the mayor, wishing Shiro luck and success in his endeavors. Shiro and Aina exited the government office, efficiently resolving all necessary formalities in just about fifteen minutes. Grateful for her assistance, Shiro thanked Aina warmly and prepared to part ways. However, realizing Shiro's unfamiliarity with the local streets, Aina volunteered to lead him to the market, the ideal place for him to establish his own stall. As they made their way, Shiro pondered over what he should sell. He sought Aina's opinion, who suggested targeting the numerous travelers frequenting the town. She pointed towards a distant forest teeming with monsters, a popular destination for adventurers to collect various items. Shiro recalled the many individuals dressed as adventurers he had noticed near the forest, which he realized was the same one he had come through. He counted himself fortunate for not having encountered any monsters on his way. Aina then guided Shiro on a comprehensive tour around the market. They first visited a lantern shop, then moved on to stores selling cloaks and sleeping bags, a weapons shop, and finally a rope seller. Throughout their market tour, they walked hand in hand, exploring every nook and cranny. Shiro, observing Aina's thoughtful gestures and kindness, reflected on how she would grow up to be an excellent wife. Her presence stirred in him a newfound desire for a family of his own, sooner rather than later. In this moment of reflection, Shiro also came to a decision about the nature of the merchandise he would sell. The following morning marked the beginning of their ventures. Aina continued with her usual routine of selling flowers, while Shiro prepared his own stall. He laid out a cloth on the ground, neatly arranging his items, and patiently waited for his first customers. While Aina faced some challenges in selling her flowers, Shiro's stall attracted its first visitor, a young man intrigued by the unfamiliar sight of Shiro's merchandise. Shiro eagerly explained that what the man initially mistook for a simple paper box was, in fact, a matchbox. He demonstrated its use by extracting a small wooden stick and striking it against the side of the box, producing a flame right in front of the astounded customer. The man's reaction, a mix of disbelief and shock, caused him to stumble and fall. This unusual display quickly captivated the attention of nearby pedestrians, drawing a crowd around Shiro's stall. Curious onlookers watched intently as Shiro performed the match-striking demonstration again. Their faces registered sheer amazement and their reactions varied from disbelief to excitement, as they debated among themselves, wondering if this small but extraordinary act was some kind of magic. It was unbelievable to the crowd that just by striking a wooden stick against a piece of paper, one could create fire. Shiro invited everyone to try it for themselves, aiming to draw all attention to his stall. The day before, after a full exploration of the market, he had realized that the locals in this town had never seen matches, and perhaps, the same was true for this entire world. Thus, Shiro quickly returned to his own world to buy several boxes of matches to sell here. From a 250-year-old elder to young adventurers, none had ever seen this miraculous item. To them, while kindling dry wood was time-consuming but manageable, 
carrying a hefty magical artifact everywhere was an ordeal, not to mention the fear of being without a witch's companionship. Feeling the timing was right to set a price, Shiro confidently started his sales pitch. Amidst the bustling crowd, the young man from earlier inquired about the price, making everyone anxious about the potential high cost of this precious item. Shiro playfully asked the young man how much he thought it should cost, to which he replied 80 coins. Shiro smiled, knowing he had two options in this world, firstly, to sell them as a luxury item at a sky-high price, and secondly, to sell them cheaper and make a profit on volume. The first option would yield high profits per transaction but limit the number of buyers. The second, however, would attract a larger customer base at the cost of lower profit per sale. Deciding on the first approach, Shiro loudly announced to everyone that each box contained 40 matches and, as a special opening day offer, would be sold for 5 coins per box. The crowd went silent for 3 seconds before erupting into a frenzy, pushing and shoving to buy in bulk. By the end of the day, Shiro had sold to 100 people. Exhausted, he lay on the ground, gasping for breath, wondering how he would handle even more customers the next day. Without further thought, he quickly packed up and went to find Aina. Aina, struggling with her sales, seemed disheartened as the beautiful flowers weren't attracting much interest. Her mood, however, brightened instantly when she heard Shiro's voice calling her. When Shiro inquired about her day's flower sales, Aina couldn't hold back her feelings of disappointment and burst into tears, turning to run away. Shiro quickly grasped her hand, pulling her back, and proposed that the next day Aina should come to help him at his stall, offering to pay her for her work. Initially, Aina was taken aback by the offer, but soon her confusion turned to joy, and she eagerly accepted, grateful for the opportunity to work alongside Shiro. Shiro, anticipating a busy day ahead, received many thanks from the young girl before they parted ways. After ensuring Aina had left, Shiro sneaked next to a wall, opening a spatial dimension to the other world and returned home. The clueless dog in the backyard could only bark and watch as he disappeared. This portal linked to the wardrobe at his house, and Shiro could summon it from anywhere by simply thinking about it. Once inside, he hurried to his room and took out the bags of coins and silver, counting them thoroughly. Then, using his skill of equivalent exchange, he converted the currency into Japanese yen. Calculating his earnings for just an hour of sales, Shiro was astonished to find he had made as much as a month's salary at his old job. Elated by the thought, he mused that continuing at this rate might soon allow him to live comfortably without working for the rest of his life. To achieve this dream, Shiro realized he needed to return to the supermarket to buy more matches. Previously he hadn't noticed, but now he discovered weather-resistant matches, capable of withstanding wind and water. Quickly filling a shopping cart, he headed to the checkout, where the cashier sweated nervously, wondering if he was planning to set a fire with such a massive purchase. Meanwhile, Shiro struggled with the bulky load, the two large shopping bags proving too heavy and exhausting. Then he remembered he possessed another skill. Setting the bags down, he focused his thoughts and a new space materialized. Shiro recognized it as his personal storage dimension. He started throwing all the matchboxes into this bottomless space. Previously, he had difficulty fitting all the matches into his backpack, but now with such a large quantity to collect, one backpack wouldn't suffice. Fortunately, he had this expansive three-dimensional space at his disposal. Not only that, the storage space even displayed information about each item it contained. Shiro was amazed by this power and strongly believed in a future where he would be wealthy without worrying about basic needs. Far away, on his way back from the supermarket, a mother and her child noticed Shiro's excited demeanor. The innocent child pointed at him and told his mother that there was a strange man talking to himself. Hearing this unintentional comment, Shiro's face flushed red. He quickly closed his mouth and hurried home. In two different worlds, both Shiro and Aina left their homes and headed to the same location. When they met, a large crowd had already gathered on the street. Shiro was worried as he set up his stall. The large number of customers was causing difficulties for the neighboring shops, and he feared this might lead to significant trouble. As he was thinking this, the owner of the grilled meat stall called out to him. The man had heard about the powerful item known as the matchbox and wanted to see the seller in person. To his surprise, it was Shiro. Seeing Shiro struggling to manage the stall with the overwhelming crowd, 
the woman next to the stall owner offered Shiro to rent a space in the outskirts of the town, even proposing it to be free for the day. Shiro was thrilled at this offer, realizing that moving to another location would not affect the nearby stalls. Both he and Aina deeply thanked the two people in front of them. Now curious about the identity of the unfamiliar woman, the stall owner introduced her as his sister, though the two didn't look alike at all. Upon reaching the new stall location, Shiro and Aina busily started to arrange the items. They developed their own signs for smoother operations, S for small matchboxes, B for large ones, and another type for survival matchboxes. Finally, it was time to open. The queue of customers stretched endlessly, much like the path to one's crush's heart. When they officially started selling, both were incredibly busy, especially Aina, whose short stature made it difficult for her to reach the items quickly. Shiro took care of interacting and advising the customers, while Aina, though tirelessly working, felt a strong sense of joy in her task. The matchboxes sold like hotcakes, visibly depleting in number. Eventually, as expected, they sold out, leaving several customers disappointedly returning home. The grilled meat stall owner and his sister were also delighted to have helped Shiro with his sales. In just three hours, they had made 1.5 million coins, which equated to 500,000 yen per hour, double what Shiro had earned the day before. Staring at the substantial amount of money, Shiro felt dizzy with excitement, like a millionaire. He put all the coins into a bag and then into his storage space. Taking out a portion, he handed it to Aina as her wages for the day. Sitting down, Shiro gently patted Aina's head and suggested she use the money to buy something nice for herself and her mother, acknowledging her significant help that day. Aina's face lit up with joy and gratitude as she thanked Shiro. She was so effusive in her thanks that Shiro had to gently place a finger on her lips. Overly excessive thanks felt distant, and after all, it was Shiro who needed her. Suddenly remembering something, Shiro opened his backpack and took out two sandwiches, handing one to Aina. They hadn't eaten all day. Upon seeing the food, Aina eagerly took a bite, her eyes sparkling with delight. It was her first time tasting this white bread sandwich, and she found the flavor surprisingly well matched. As they were enjoying their meal, a woman approached them. Standing before Shiro, she introduced herself as Karen Sankarika, the mayor of the city. Shiro, thinking she wanted to buy matches, mentioned they were sold out for the day. However, Karen clarified that she wasn't there to buy matches, but rather to meet him, the famous match seller. Shiro was surprised that the mayor of Ninorich was such a beautiful woman, he had imagined the mayor to be a rugged, rough man. The woman greeted Shiro with an elegant gesture, expressing her honor and fortune to have a merchant of his caliber in their city. Seeing Shiro's modest reaction, Karen turned away and continued speaking. She mentioned that the city, being in a remote location, had stubborn traders who believed they had to bear a great burden and responsibility, resulting in them selling their goods at very high prices. Meanwhile, the products sold by Karen's group were priced so low that their finances never really improved. No one seemed capable of addressing this issue until Karen stepped in, wanting to establish a marketplace in the town. She saw Shiro's assistance as vital for this project. Handing him a key from her pocket without allowing him time to wonder, Karen explained that it was the spare key to her house. Aina, witnessing this, loudly exclaimed that the mayor must want to live with Shiro, perhaps even marry him, which left Shiro speechless and alarmed. Karen, unable to bear this misunderstanding any longer, clarified that it wasn't about her seeking a life partner but about wanting to collaborate with Shiro. The key opened an empty house nearby, and she proposed he set up shop on the first floor. Karen mentioned that some local traders had complained about the large crowds resembling a busy market, which they didn't appreciate. Shiro fell silent, realizing that continuing in the current state would be challenging for his business. Karen then led him to view the house. After a tour, both Shiro and Aina quite liked this new selling space. Shiro decided to open his shop there the next day. Karen didn't linger long and was about to leave, but she had one question. Aina whispered to Shiro, guessing the mayor might ask if he was engaged. Shiro, misinterpreting the situation, was about to offer a clear explanation about his status and background. Karen quickly interrupted, clarifying she wasn't interested in that. She merely wanted to know why an accomplished merchant like Shiro would choose to trade in Nina Rich, a small city of only about 500 inhabitants, 
when he could potentially do better in a more bustling location. Contrary to those thoughts, Shiro was quite content with this question, simply stating he liked it there. Although he had only been in the town for three days, he had met many good people, the kind-hearted grilled meat stall owner, hard-working Aina, and a mayor who treated a stranger so well. These reasons alone were enough for Shiro to fall in love with the town. Karen was moved to tears by Shiro's words. All three of them shook hands, happy to have made new friends and confident that their collaboration would further strengthen the town. This was how, in just three days, the matchstick seller came to own his shop, signing a month-long contract for a space in the town square and starting work immediately. Five days later, when the match sales hit a record and there was nothing left to sell, Shiro and Aina apologized to the late-coming customers. Shiro guessed he had supplied enough matches for everyone in town, yet they remained in high demand. After tidying up the stall, Shiro told Aina to rest while he brought up some tea and snacks to her room. Finding Aina asleep, he placed them on the table. Stirred by the slight noise, the drowsy eight-year-old mistook Shiro for her father, rushing to hug him and falling asleep on his shoulder. The reluctant father had to carry the exhausted child back to bed and tuck her in. It had been a hard few days for her. On this fifth day of business, customers had to return early in the morning due to the lack of stock. Shiro actually wanted a day off, feeling utterly exhausted. Karen entered, mentioning that if he accepted her request, there would soon be a visit from the capital. The committee was discussing the possibility of officially establishing a branch, and Karen wanted Shiro to demonstrate his matches to the visiting officials to help solidify Nainrich's position. Shiro agreed to the request. Karen, seeing this, remarked it was her first time seeing such an item and asked where he had obtained it. Hesitating, Shiro didn't fully disclose, and Karen didn't press further, noting that if only Shiro sold these, it would attract significant attention from the committee members. She implied that using the matches to draw the attention of the assessors could, in turn, attract more people to Nino Rich. This would encourage other merchants to invest more in developing local human resources. Shiro, looking at the matchbox in his hand, thought it might just be a successful endeavor. Shiro was contemplating adding some new and interesting items to enrich the merchandise variety in Nino Rich, but he couldn't quite decide what those might be yet. The next afternoon, the shop had to close again as all the products sold out. Sitting in his chair, Shiro racked his brain, trying to figure out how to attract the attention of the inspectors from the committee. He decided to visit Karen for a bit, asking Aina to stay and watch the shop. At the mayor's office, Karen, hearing that Shiro had sold out early again, joked that he was truly an experienced merchant. Shiro didn't quite agree, mentioning that the quantity of merchandise he sold was five times the town's population. He had heard rumors that some people were reselling his matchboxes at exorbitant prices elsewhere. The rumor was spreading, and more people were starting to do the same. Shiro suggested that they should limit the number of items sold. Karen then shared something she wanted to discuss, and they went upstairs for a more detailed conversation. Sitting down, Karen asked if he knew about an adventurer's guild in the town called Silver Moon. Surprisingly, Shiro was quite familiar with them, knowing many of his customers were adventurers from this guild. The guild operated like a middleman trade organization, accepting requests from clients and passing them on to the adventurers. Their tasks ranged from monster extermination to collecting medicinal herbs and mushrooms. Karen continued, explaining that Silver Moon was the only adventurer's guild in town, led by a man named Gilmas. His leadership had an appealing allure for the young adventurers. However, Gilmas had fled the previous night, leaving the guild in disarray. Without funds to maintain the guild, the adventurers were preparing to leave the town, taking with them the guild's management fund. This posed a significant problem for the small, underdeveloped town, as the collapse of the trade guild would further hinder its progress. As mayor, Karen was understandably concerned. However, she had prepared a strategy before speaking with Shiro. She revealed that the capital's main adventurer's guild wanted to establish a branch in their city, which could offer a solution to their predicament. Until now, Karen had always refused because she was considering the Silver Moon Guild, but with the situation as it was, she decided to accept the proposal. Shiro fully agreed with this decision, they were on the brink of losing a crucial element of society, the adventurers. Therefore, proposing a new idea was entirely appropriate in this context. Shiro told Karen he wanted to become an adventurer. At his suggestion, 
Karen stuttered in shock, asking if he was sure. Shiro was serious, he wanted to join the guild. It was the best way to understand what adventurers needed. Karen cautioned Shiro about the dangers, noting that the only place for adventure was the eastern forest. Shiro was aware, hence he chose to be an adventurer who collected herbs and minerals, which was less dangerous. Karen was relieved to hear this, admitting that her relationship with the Silver Moon Guild leader was tense. The night before, he had come to her, red-faced and tearful, begging for a loan. Shiro was startled by this frank admission but wondered how much they needed. Karen indicated the number 10, they wanted to borrow 10 gold coins, not 10 copper or 10 silver, but 10 gold coins, equivalent to 10 million yen in Japan. It was impossible to gather such an amount in their remote location. Therefore, Karen had refused the guild leader's request, freezing their relationship. She wrote a letter of introduction for Shiro and handed it to him, though she didn't expect it to be very effective. Afterward, Shiro headed straight to the Silver Moon Guild located in the eastern part of town. Standing at the entrance, he felt nervous. He wondered if he would be knocked down or bullied as a newcomer upon entering. With a sense of trepidation, Shiro opened the door and loudly greeted everyone inside. To his surprise, the place was completely empty, not a soul in sight. Puzzled, Shiro then heard intermittent sobbing coming from afar. He approached the source of the sound, and the person ahead turned around. It turned out to be a cat-eared girl, who seemed quite surprised to see someone there. Her aggressive nature flared up as she yelled that if Shiro dared to take another step closer, she would summon thousands of formidable warriors from the Silver Moon to tear him apart. Shiro, skeptical, mumbled doubtfully that there was no one else around. Hearing this, the girl pouted and shouted that she alone was enough to crush Shiro, boasting that her thunderous punch could shatter a rock, let alone a frail human. Shiro rolled his eyes at her exaggeration, sighing softly as he gently asked about the whereabouts of the temporary guild leader, emphasizing the importance of this information and hoping she could summon that person. The cat-eared girl looked stunned for a moment but then agreed, before suddenly pointing to herself and declaring that she was the acting guild leader. This time, it was Shiro's turn to be shocked as he exclaimed loudly in surprise. The cat-eared girl that Shiro meets is named Emil, and she's the acting president of the Silver Moon Society. Aside from her, there are no other staff members in the society. Actually, there was another young girl, but her whereabouts became unknown after the former president disappeared. Emil and Shiro talked for five hours straight, with her drinking liquor like water and using a wealth of language to curse those who fled. Seeing his opportunity, Shiro presented a letter of introduction from the mayor to Emil, who angrily growled upon hearing the mayor's name, asking if he meant that big-chested, small-brained woman. Shiro, startled, laughed it off and softly corrected that he was referring to Karen San, the mayor of Nino Rich City. Emil cynically remarked that all the nutrients the mayor consumed seemed to go to her chest rather than her brain, calling her the rudest person she'd ever met. Emil tore up the letter Shiro had given her, angrily stating that the mayor who abandoned the Silver Moon Society to promote another guild was a filthy, inhumane person. Meanwhile, Mayor Karen, elsewhere, sneezed, surely someone must be speaking ill of her. Emil, sobbing, continued that she had begged Karen for a loan of ten coins, but was refused. Shiro immediately consoled her, explaining that ten coins, especially gold ones, were quite valuable and hard to come by quickly, and besides, Karen had her own concerns. Before Shiro could finish, Emil interrupted, accusing him of defending Karen. She had thought she and Karen were close friends, and was shocked things had turned out this way. Without money, the society was bound to close down sooner or later. Despairingly, Emil collapsed onto the floor. Without saying much, Shiro pulled a tissue from his pocket and handed it to her. After a moment's thought, he mentioned that he had the authority to commission the Silver Moon Society for a mission, and needed her help. Emil sat up, taking a pen. If Shiro wanted to join, she would create a special escort request, something unprecedented. She could think of only one competent team for the job, a four-member group known as Azure Sky, though their services were quite expensive. The following day, Shiro returned to his shop to pack up his belongings, solemnly hanging a closed sign on the door. Aina, his assistant, expressed her sadness about having to shut down the shop temporarily. Shiro, aiming to lift her spirits, reassured her that it would only be for three days. 
He explained that he would be engaging in a bit of pretend exploration and then would return to continue their regular business. Aina, heartened by this, quickly perked up and scurried away, as she too had a few personal tasks to attend to. The two bid each other farewell with a promise to reconvene in a few days. Upon Shiro's arrival at the Silver Moon Society, he was greeted by Emil, who had been eagerly awaiting his presence. Inside, four individuals were seated, forming what appeared to be a diverse and ready team. Emil proceeded to introduce Shiro to each member, outlining that this time, they were to embark on a joint expedition to gather rare medicinal herbs. The team was led by a strikingly handsome man, whom Shiro recognized after a moment of contemplation as the very first customer who had bought matches from him. The leader, named Liar, approached Shiro to provide further introductions. He began with Rolf, a priest with an unconventional fighting style involving wielding a mace to strike his opponents. Next was Nesca, a mage of few words but profound magical prowess, although her casting speed left a bit to be desired. Nesca displayed a hint of dissatisfaction with Lyre's somewhat blunt introduction, tapping him on the head with her staff in a playful yet admonishing manner. The final member of the team didn't wait for Lyre to introduce her, she eagerly stepped forward to greet Shiro herself. Her name was Kilfa, and her distinguishing cat-like ears immediately caught Shiro's attention, prompting him to inquire if she belonged to a feline species. Lyre humorously suggested that Shiro might harbor a dislike for cat people, referencing his previous mission's clients. Contrary to this, Shiro found Kilfa's demeanor quite endearing. Kilfa, flattered by Shiro's compliment, turned a shade of bashful red, brandishing her knife with a newfound enthusiasm and vowing to give her all in battle. Lyre added that Kilfa's role in the team was as a scout, adept at navigating and detecting potential traps and dangers. With the introductions complete, the group, now a quintet with Shiro's inclusion, embarked on their venture, fully prepared for the upcoming challenges in the mysterious eastern territories. The Azure Sky team, comprising four distinctive members, Rolf the warrior priest, Nesca the witch, Kilfa the scout, and Lyre the leader, along with Shiro, set off with a mix of anticipation and resolve. Lyre, sensing Shiro's apprehension, offered words of comfort, assuring him that they would strive to steer clear of monstrous encounters as much as possible. Yet, he cautioned that the quest for the elusive herbs might not be straightforward. Rolf, with a tone of confidence, chimed in, optimistic that finding the herbs would not pose a significant challenge to their seasoned abilities. The critical task was to find a high-grade herb, which would signify the completion of their mission. However, having traveled the whole day with the evening setting in, they needed to find a temporary resting place. Lyre decided to halt their journey for the day, adhering to an unspoken rule of resting when lost. Shiro, hearing this, tearfully wished he had heard such advice from his former boss, admiring Lyre as an exemplary leader. The five of them got to work setting up camp, building a large fire to huddle around. Everyone was grateful for Shiro's convenient matches, with Lyre predicting they would become a big hit when introduced in the capital. Rolf, however, warned that the infamous traitors there wouldn't let Shiro off easily, foreseeing potential troubles. Lyre, with a wry smile, acknowledged Rolf's often accurate predictions. Amidst their conversation, Nesca complained of hunger. Exhausted from the day's journey, everyone silently took their share of the meal. Shiro gazed at the simple meal of dried meat and hard bread, a stark reminder of the austere dining habits even regular travelers in the wild had. Noticing Shiro's reluctance to eat, Kilfa offered him a piece of jerky, but he declined, instead pulling out various items like instant noodles, rice, bread, and sicula from his backpack. The other four members were astonished, their eyes and mouths wide open in surprise. They curiously asked about these unfamiliar items and wondered if Shiro could consume them all alone. Shiro, with a laugh, clarified that he couldn't possibly eat it all by himself, he had brought the food for everyone, as they were new products from a convenience store. He thought it would be nice for everyone to try them and share their feedback. Lyre opted for the noodles, Kilfa for the rice balls, Rolf for the bread, and Nesca for the sicula. The meal turned into a grand feast, concluding with unanimous praise for the deliciousness of the food. Kilfa was especially full, to the point of being unable to walk. Nesca quietly added these dishes to her list of foods to eat again, while Rolf was emotionally moved to tears, having never tasted anything so delicious in his life as a warrior. 
After everyone else had retired to sleep, Liar and Shiro stayed behind, engaging in conversation. Shiro, curious, asked why explorers don't use sleeping bags. Liar explained that they're cumbersome to move around, especially in winter when not using blankets is almost a death sentence due to the cold, but using them makes the luggage heavier. He voiced a desire for a personal storage space, a sentiment Shiro empathized with, almost spitting out his drink in surprise. Liar added that only about one in a hundred thousand people might possess such an ability. There are even rumors of an ancient civilization's dungeon holding a book about storage space. Shiro, sweating nervously, admitted that he actually possessed such a storage space, along with the two books mentioned. He asked Liar to speculate on the value of finding such items. Liar pondered and then replied that it could be worth as much as a carriage or enough to buy a noble's mansion, essentially a fortune one couldn't spend in a lifetime. Shiro silently felt fortunate for not revealing the existence of the two books to anyone and planned to examine them later. Just as they were about to sleep, Liar suddenly heard a noise. He quickly drew his sword and woke up the other three, alerting them to something approaching, a monstrous creature, a giant beast. While the rest were up, Nesca was still half asleep, dreaming about Sikula. Shiro rushed to wake her up. Kilfa tried to pick up a scent but to no avail, as the creature was downwind and her senses were ineffective. Liar urged Nesca to prepare her magic, as the enemy's silhouette became visible. Everyone quickly took their fighting positions. A massive brown bear appeared before them, and Liar admitted that desperate explorers like them stood no chance against it. Escape seemed impossible, and he reckoned that only Kilfa might have a slim chance of getting away. Kilfa, however, adamantly refused to abandon the group. The situation demanded someone act as bait for the beast, and Shiro feared that as the newcomer and the non-explorer with no magical abilities, he would be the likely choice for this sacrificial role. Shiro, bracing for the worst, expected Liar to approach him and whisper that, for the sake of everyone's survival, he must act as bait. However, the reality unfolded differently. Liar, with a resolute voice, instructed Shiro and the two female teammates to escape, while he and Rolf would stay back to distract the beast. Liar, sharing a moment of camaraderie, turned to apologize to Rolf, who simply smiled back, understanding the depth of their long-standing friendship. Standing on the brink of life and death, Liar wanted to share his final words with his teammate, who had been through thick and thin with him, and more importantly, the person he harbored feelings for. He confessed to Nesca, asking her to understand his last act of bravery before death, calling himself a fool. Liar commanded that as soon as he and Rolf engaged the creature, the other three should flee. But before they could act, Kilfa sensed another creature's breath approaching from a different direction. Suddenly, they found themselves caught between two attacking monsters. Liar shouted for everyone to run, but it was too late, they were trapped. In the midst of despair, Shiro rummaged for something in his possession, refusing to lose faith in himself. He pulled out several large fireworks from his storage space, lit them, and hurled them at the giant bear. The fireworks caused the bear to stagger back, and seizing the moment, Shiro sprayed it directly in the eyes with pepper spray, causing it to howl in agony. But the other creature was still a threat. As it lunged at Shiro, he met it with a contemptuous smile and effortlessly repeated his tactic, spraying it in the eyes too. Both bears were now helplessly pawing at their eyes in pain. Shiro was taken aback by the effectiveness of his simple yet ingenious tactic. Liar, in awe, asked what sort of magic he had used. Shiro turned and explained that it was just a regular item containing a toxic gas, all he had to do was aim and spray at the enemy. Liar, though still somewhat confused, realized that the current situation was not the time for lengthy explanations. With the bear's eyes and nostrils compromised by the pepper spray, Liar recognized the prime opportunity for an attack. As a seasoned traveler, he understood the importance of seizing the moment. He directed his team to strike at the beasts. Collaborating effectively, they soon triumphed over the two massive bears. However, before the group could fully celebrate their victory, Shiro's remark struck like a bolt from the blue. He pointed out that Liar seemed to have confessed his feelings for Nesca earlier in the heat of the moment. The atmosphere instantly became tense, with both Liar and Nesca blushing and fumbling for words. Liar, trying to deflect the awkward situation, quickly shifted the focus to butchering the bear meat, recognizing that their hard-fought battle yielded valuable resources. 
The team divided the tasks, Kilfa dealt with extracting the bear's teeth, while Lyre skillfully skinned the hides. Nesca was responsible for collecting and storing the blood in leather bags, which she then preserved using a magic freezing spell. A moment of curiosity arose when Kilfa, holding up the bear testicles, inquired about their purpose. Rolf, with his knowledge of medicinal uses, explained that they could be used to make healing remedies. The feline like Kilfa, undeterred by the nature of the task, promptly began processing them. Shiro, somewhat uncomfortable with the scene, discreetly averted his gaze. After completing their respective tasks, with the bear hides neatly placed on the ground, Lyre approached Shiro. He proposed pausing their original mission to first sell the fresh bear meat in town, arguing that it was even more valuable than the sought-after herbs. Recognizing Shiro's critical contribution to their success, Lyre offered him half of one bear as a token of appreciation. Shiro, feeling a bit sheepish, suddenly found himself nearly tackled by an overly enthusiastic Kilfa aiming for a grateful hug. However, her plan went awry as Shiro inadvertently dodged, causing her to stumble into a bush. Shiro then addressed Liar, understanding his reasoning offering to assist with transporting the bears. The team members, skeptical about Shiro's ability to carry the massive weight, were left in awe as he opened up his storage space, revealing its capacity. Shiro apologized for not disclosing this secret earlier, his actions leading to a mix of surprise and admiration among his companions. While everyone was still gaping in astonishment at Shiro's magical feat of storing the two bears, he slung his backpack on, ready to continue the journey. Just when Shiro thought they would return to Nina Rich, Lyre suggested that since they had stored the bears in the space, they could still continue searching for the high-grade herbs. Thus, Shiro's expedition was extended by another two days. Upon returning, Aina eagerly awaited them on the road, her joy evident. Mistaking Aina for Shiro's daughter, Lyre received a correction from Shiro, who explained that she was a great help at his shop. The group then made their way to the Silver Moon Society to finalize their mission. As they opened the door, they were greeted by a scene they would never forget. Before them was Emil, tears streaming down her face, being berated by an angry man. Curious, Shiro inquired about the man's identity. Liar speculated that he might be a merchant dealing in materials. The man was furiously chastising Emil for repeatedly promising to pay him back but failing to do so for half a year, and he was adamant about not letting it go this time. As Emil pleaded and promised to repay the debt, Shiro approached them, introducing himself as a trader from the town and expressing interest in understanding the situation. The man, Gerald, softened a bit upon hearing this and introduced himself as a materials merchant. He explained that the former president of the society had borrowed ten gold coins from him, using the society's main building as collateral. Presenting the contract to Shiro, Gerald declared that if the debt remained unpaid, the building would legally become his property. He impatiently urged Emil to bring out the land ownership documents. Emil, naturally resistant to this, further angered Gerald. He criticized her loyalty to Blotto, the former president who had abandoned her, questioning why she wouldn't let go of the society that was heading towards its demise, suggesting it might be better to do so. Emil, holding back her emotions and clenching her fists, responded after a moment, stating that her actions were not out of loyalty. Emil, holding back her emotions, asserted that the Silver Moon Society was where she truly belonged, a place for someone like her, a half-beast who often faced scorn. The society was filled with both happy and sad memories, but the good ones far outweighed the bad, and it held a special place in her heart. That's why Emil couldn't bear the thought of losing it. Shiro, reflecting on her words, remembered a similar situation from his past. Five years ago, two years after his grandmother's death, his relatives had advised him to sell the family house. Hearing this, Shiro had pleaded on his knees, begging them not to sell the house filled with memories of his grandmother, as if his life depended on it. Shiro realized his circumstances were somewhat parallel to Emil's. But for Emil, the burden of the debt she was carrying was immense. Just as Gerald was about to take possession of the land ownership papers, Shiro intervened. While his plan was unclear, Emil looked at him with hopeful eyes. Shiro then presented the bear's skin to her, asking if she would like to buy it. Before Emil could fully comprehend the offer, Gerald, recognizing the item, became visibly agitated. He identified it as the rare hide of a brown bear, a fortunate sight for few. 
Gerald immediately offered to buy it. Shiro didn't refuse but stated that the skin belonged to the society. He suggested loaning it to Emil, with repayment at her convenience. Liar, standing beside them, chimed in, offering a similar deal with their own equivalent goods. Emil agreed, and Gerald proposed to buy all the items for 34 gold coins. Emil quickly raised the price by an additional 2 gold coins, making it a total of 36, plus 2 more for the bare testicles, concluding the deal at a net gain of 26 gold coins after paying off the 10 gold coin debt. After acquiring what he wanted, Gerald donned his hat and backpack, expressing a desire for future collaborations with the group. This suggested he wished for the continued existence of the Silver Moon Society. Finally, with only six people left inside the house, Emil turned to Lyre and bowed her head in gratitude. Lyre promptly refused the thanks, suggesting that Shiro was the one who deserved it the most, as they were all members of the society after all. He proposed that rather than thanks, Emil should confirm the completion of their mission and pay them for their work. Emil, feeling a bit deflated, mumbled about having to confirm it right in front of Shiro. Shiro, puzzled, questioned what the issue was with doing it in front of him, since he was the one who had hired them. How could the protection mission be confirmed without the client, Shiro, present? Seeing Emil's hesitant and awkward demeanor, Lyre stepped closer and suspiciously questioned whether the temporary president was hiding something. He stretched out his hand, demanding the 30 silver coins as payment for completing their mission. Shiro was surprised, recalling that he had already paid a hundred silver coins for this mission. Was the remaining seventy supposed to be for the society? The atmosphere grew tense, and just as Emil was about to slip away, Lyre quickly grabbed her by the collar. The remaining members of Azure Sky readied their magic, preparing to teach her a lesson. Realizing she was in for a rough time, Emil quickly apologized and tried to escape, but the sound of explosions and her shrieks echoed continuously. Shiro silently felt relieved that he hadn't brought Aina along, knowing she would have been disappointed by the society's president. Returning to his shop after three days, he was greeted by the sight of Aina cleaning the house. Hearing the noise, she looked up and joyfully inquired about his adventurous journey. Setting down his backpack, Shiro used two decades worth of vocabulary and a series of gestures to describe his thrilling experiences to the enthusiastic Aina concluding with the remark that the past three days had been incredibly intense. Aina's admiration grew as she learned about the impressive feat of taking down the giant grey bear. Even with the help of Azure Sky, Shiro had played a significant part in the victory. Their conversation was interrupted by a knock at the door. Shiro went to answer it and, before he could react, found himself enveloped in a warm embrace. Karen hugged Shiro so tightly that he struggled to breathe due to the lack of air, while Aina, standing beside them, looked on with great concern. Although Shiro quite liked this suffocating feeling, he still had to wriggle free. Karen, worried, asked him if he was hurt by the grey bear and also inquired if he learned anything during his travels with the explorers. Shiro confidently replied that he had indeed learned a lot, and if they managed to restock in time, the inspectors from the city would surely be impressed. Karen smirked at this and teased, managed to restock. How? She moved closer to Shiro and whispered in his ear, suggesting he might have a storage space or a container with spatial capabilities. Shiro, initially denying it, finally admitted the truth after Karen's persistent questioning. She revealed she was only bluffing, meeting someone with such a rare skill was unlikely, she had guessed based on the abundance of matchboxes he had stored. A silence enveloped them, truly befitting the astuteness of the mayor, she always had a thorough grasp of matters. Returning to the main topic, Karen was curious about what Shiro planned to sell next, with Aina equally intrigued about her next assignment. Shiro showed them a prototype of his upcoming product, leaving Karen amazed at its existence and pondering the impact it would have upon release. In the afternoon, Lyre and Nesca visited Shiro's shop. Since their encounter with the Grey Bear, they had started dating. Lyre mentioned that Emil told him about the inspectors from other guilds coming to their town, hoping this would lead to the expansion of the town with new branches. Furthermore, the inspectors hailed from a guild with a good reputation, raising hopes for the town's development. Shiro was surprised to hear that there were even less reputable guilds. Lyre explained that many guilds had a very bad reputation, citing examples like the Three-Pronged Devils and the Venomous Dragon Fangs, but perhaps the most notorious was the Labyrinth Robbers Guild. 
Shiro wondered if Karen was aware of this guild's existence. Liar wasn't sure, but he thought Karen might know of the guilds, as only travelers or locals tend to know about their misdeeds. Hearing this, Shiro pondered whether this world, seemingly devoid of phones and social media, allowed such misdeeds to persist more easily. The worst of the travelers' guilds were coming to survey this land, and he hoped nothing bad would happen to Ninorich. Aina and Shiro had been waiting for the city inspectors for quite some time, but they still hadn't shown up. Aina wondered if they had gotten lost. Shiro thought it unlikely because there was only one straight road leading from here to the next town, and moreover, Karen had been waiting at the gate since yesterday. As the evening bell rang, Aina asked to leave early. Shiro went to the door to bid her goodbye and decided to close the shop early for the day. Just then, a beautiful woman arrived, expressing her desire to see his shop. Shiro welcomed her to browse freely. The woman picked up a box of matches and examined it. Shiro approached to show her how to strike a match, noticing her eyes widen in surprise. Beside her was a silver box, Shiro explained that it was a new product, a space blanket designed to warm the body. The woman immediately tried draping it over her shoulders. Despite being a new item, the space blanket was already popular among travelers, even impressing Karen. The woman seemed to really like it, thin yet very warm. There were also collapsible water bottles and other products. After trying a few items, the woman left in a hurry for an urgent matter, and Shiro, though curious, did not pry further. A few days later, Aina burst in, urgently calling for Shiro, the inspector had arrived in town and was at Mayor Karen's place. According to the plan, Karen was supposed to lead him around the town, to the market, and then to Shiro's shop for a discussion, but the plan had fallen apart. Now, everyone was gathering at the Silver Moon Society, and the mayor had asked Dana to bring Shiro there as quickly as possible. Upon his arrival, Karen whispered to Shiro that the inspector seemed a bit odd and advised him to be cautious with his words. Shiro exchanged a look of quiet understanding with Karen, his eyes conveying his skill in subtle manipulation. Karen took the opportunity to introduce Shiro to the inspector, Gabus, proudly declaring him the town's pride and a distinguished merchant. Aina, standing nearby, also chimed in, introducing herself as an employee working in Shiro's store. However, Inspector Gabus seemed to barely acknowledge these introductions. With a disdainful twist of his body, he commented derisively that the shop's only employee was a mere child. Demonstrating his contempt, he ran a finger over the surface of a table. Even though it was spotlessly clean, he criticized the building as dirty and accused the janitors of laziness. Emil, who had painstakingly cleaned the area, was instantly infuriated by his baseless criticism. Gabus, seemingly enjoying the turmoil he created, laughed loudly, suggesting that the disorder in the shop was their own doing. His scorn then turned to Kilfa, a half-human, half-beast worker, whom he disparaged for his inefficiency, callously remarking that such an existence was a waste of effort. Emil's temper flared, and she was on the brink of attacking, but Karen quickly intervened. She calmly asked Gabus if he had taken a look at the items for sale in Shiro's shop. In response, Gabus casually extinguished a match he had lit, carelessly throwing it onto the floor, and slumped in his chair. He declared, with a self-important air, that the Labyrinth Robbers Guild intended to establish a branch in their town, but his announcement came with several outrageous conditions. Firstly, he demanded that this new branch be the only guild allowed in the town. Secondly, it should be completely exempt from taxes. He further stipulated that the townspeople, under Karen's leadership, should bear the full cost of constructing the guild's building. But the most audacious demand was yet to come. Gabus expressed his desire to have special privileges in Shiro's shop, allowing him to acquire and sell items for free. Shiro responded with a piercing, emotionless stare, leading Gabus to mistakenly think he didn't understand and was about to mock him. However, Karen quickly stepped in, attempting to negotiate. She acknowledged the potential benefits the guild's presence could bring to the town but expressed concerns about their proposed monopoly over matches. Before she could fully articulate her point, Gabus impatiently interrupted. He elaborated that the guild planned to buy all the matches and resell them across their branches nationwide, promising enormous profits. He justified his demands by claiming that selling to them was equivalent to selling to the entire country. Upon hearing the terms, Shiro became momentarily contemplative. 
The offer was indeed tempting, but he was not in agreement. From the start, his stock was already at its limit. Karen also disagreed, expressing her desire to renegotiate the terms from scratch with Gabus. Gabus, visibly sweating, grew furious. In a fit of anger, he grabbed a bottle of wine from the table and hurled it against the wall behind Karen, deriding the town as a pathetic place inhabited only by weak, useless travelers. Shiro quickly countered, pointing out that in Nina Rich, it was still possible to find rare monsters, herbs, and metals in the eastern forests. He argued that many travelers considered this place their permanent home and wondered if that still wasn't potential enough for them to open a branch. Gabus, far from being appeased, became even more enraged. He grabbed Shiro by the collar, yelling that only fools would prefer to wallow in a run-down town like this, implying that those who couldn't compete in larger cities ended up hiding in such a decrepit place. The tension escalated, with everyone's anger reaching a boiling point. Gabus continued, stating that only with the guild's investment would this shabby town flourish, and it all depended on Shiro's decision. Seeing Shiro's hesitation, Gabus spewed more insults, suggesting that if Shiro agreed to collaborate, they would hire better staff than the weakling Pena. This infuriated Shiro, whose eyes widened with shock. Gabus reiterated his contempt, mocking the current staff as a bunch of stupid dogs and useless half-beasts. Realizing further discussion was pointless, Shiro didn't hold back. He punched Gabus squarely in the face, shouting for him to get out, calling him a dead dog. This incident reminded Shiro of a similar situation he had encountered in the modern world when he had requested leave from a corrupt company. He had punched his boss, who had been berating a colleague who had greatly helped him. The boss's face and Gabus's were strikingly similar, which had triggered Shiro's violent response. The people around Shiro looked at him with admiration. Karen added that Gabus had also slightly touched her chest. Shiro glared at the inspector and then moved forward, grabbing his hair, causing panic among the bystanders. Pleas for mercy and loud cries echoed unceasingly. Rorf, from the Heavenly Sound Group, also stepped in to give Gabus a sound beating. In no time, Inspector Gabus was sprawled on the ground, his eyes swollen purple, saliva spraying as he lay defeated. Meanwhile, Shiro stood by, looking down. Although he disliked violence, Gabus had crossed the line by insulting his employee Aina and exploiting Karen's friendliness for his own ends. Shiro wouldn't just stand by and endure such humiliation. Aina, moved by his actions, rushed to Shiro and hugged him, crying profusely. Somehow, Gabus found the strength to get up. He hurled abuses at Shiro, threatening that as a high-ranking member of the Labyrinth Robbers Guild, Shiro and the entire town would pay for this. Karen, unyielding, stepped forward and sternly told Gabus that his actions could be seen as a declaration of war against the city. If that was the case, she, as the mayor, would have to report the matter to the regional governor, Margrave Basher. Hearing this, Gabus began to sweat profusely, stuttering in fear, shocked that his words had escalated to a violent conflict. In a softer tone, Gabus then suggested to Shiro that if he handed over the match rights to them, they could pretend the incident never happened. Shiro, infuriated, grabbed Gabus by the ear, shouting that he had no interest in doing business with them and would kick them out if they dared to come near his shop. Gabus initially begged to buy the rights at any cost, but seeing Shiro unmoved, he turned to Karen, attempting to continue discussions about opening a branch in Ninorich. However, Karen, now repulsed by his behavior, also refused. Liar, unable to hold back his laughter, found humor in Gabus's desperate situation. Gabus, embarrassed and angry, insulted Lyre as a low-class traveler. This was the final straw for Lyre, who had endured Gabus's insults repeatedly. He swiftly approached Gabus and grabbed him by the neck, lifting him up. Shiro intervened, reminding Lyre that violence wasn't the answer and recalling how he himself had just beaten up Gabus. Lyre, however, merely dropped Gabus to the ground, stating that hitting such scum would only dirty his hands. As if granted a reprieve, Inspector Gabus crawled towards the main door in fear, leaving everyone seething from the failed negotiation. Karen advised everyone not to dwell on the unpleasant encounter with the arrogant inspector. Suddenly, a knock on the door was heard. Thinking Gabus had returned, Lyre boldly went to open the door, fists ready, only to be met by a beautiful young woman. 
After bowing to everyone, she mentioned that she had rushed over after hearing that the mayor was present, as she had an urgent matter to discuss. Shiro recognized her as the woman who had visited his shop a few days earlier to look at his merchandise. She introduced herself as Enyai Mirage, a member of the Fairy's Blessing Guild. Liar was surprised, recognizing it as the largest guild in the country. Karen, suspicious, inquired about her intentions. Nei smiled and explained that the Fairy's Blessing Guild was interested in collaborating with the town to open a new branch and wondered what the mayor's thoughts were. Everyone was somewhat taken aback by this proposal. Kilfa suspected it might be a trap. Nei sighed upon hearing this but then turned enthusiastically to Kilfa, asking if she was a member of their guild. Nei revealed that if they used their guild as a branch of the Fairy's Blessing Guild, they could expect a significant profit, at least five times more than current. Kilfa immediately stepped back from Nei, adopting a respectful stance and agreeing to the proposal. She even turned to persuade Karen to accept this lucrative deal, a complete reversal from her initial skepticism. Karen was still hesitant, asking Shiro for his opinion. He suggested they listen to more from Nei before deciding. The group moved to Kilfa's office, where Shiro, Karen, and Nei sat opposite each other. Shiro asked Nei why her guild was interested in opening a branch in Nino Rich. Nei explained that a few days earlier, a team from her guild had discovered a map of a dungeon territory, seemingly created by an ancient magical civilization. This was a discovery that had never been made before, hence it was dubbed the find of the century. However, the key revelation was that these ruins originated right here, in the western forest, with countless sites like ancient kingdoms, mazes, and temples. Hearing about this new potential of the city, Karen excitedly stood up, hardly believing it. She realized that the labyrinth robbers' desire to establish a branch here was likely because they also knew about this discovery and wanted to monopolize it. They typically used force, but this time they were rejected. So Nei, representing the fairies' blessing guild, came to negotiate, intending to use all their power to excavate these sites. Another reason for choosing Nino Rich was Shiro's shop. Nei had seen the items he sold and was impressed. She believed they would be immensely beneficial for the guild, so she hoped Shiro would consider opening another shop within their guild. Karen was contemplative, asking Nei what the fairy's blessing guild's conditions would be if they opened a branch in Nino Rich. Nei was initially surprised but became furious when Shiro explained the demands made by Inspector Gabus. She was appalled that Gabus, after securing the right to open a branch, dared to make such outrageous demands, not to mention his sexual harassment and insults. However, when discussing the fairy's blessing guild, Ney's demeanor changed completely. The Silver Moon Society had approved her request, so they could start their business without building a new structure. Nonetheless, their staff would need accommodations for dining and resting, so they would pay for building a lodge and renting the necessary equipment. Karen had no objections to this offer, it was too attractive. She cleared her throat, stood up, and extended her hand, saying that Nino Rich would be honored to collaborate with Ney's guild. Nei was also overjoyed at having completed her mission. And just like that, the once dormant Silver Moon Society became a branch of the country's largest fairies blessing guild. It was a spectacular turnaround. Aina was a naive young girl, unaccustomed to worldly affairs. Her family consisted of three members, and at the age of four, she lived happily in a small house with her parents. But then, on a foreboding overcast day, a sign of looming trouble, the village where they lived was set ablaze in the war. The fierce red flames engulfed everything, including their house and Aina's cherished toys, turning everything into ashes. The scene was heartbreakingly tragic, but perhaps the most painful part for the little girl was watching her father leave to fulfill his duty as a soldier, responsibility of every citizen. Two years passed without her father's return, Aina was now six. Her mother told her they would move to another town. Aina resisted, thinking if her father returned and didn't find them, he would be heartbroken. Seeing her daughter's distress, Aina's mother was speechless, only able to silently hug her daughter and cry. Eventually, they left their old home and, after crossing many borders, arrived in Nino Rich. When asked why they chose such a remote place to live, Aina's mother said it was because the war wouldn't reach there. She didn't want anyone else to have to leave. But life in a border town wasn't easy. To ensure her daughter had enough to eat, Aina's mother ate as little as possible, 
saving most of the food for her. In their second year in Ninorich, Aina's mother fell gravely ill, apologizing to Aina for not being able to provide for her fully. Aina blamed herself for being a burden. She cried a lot, realizing it wouldn't help if she didn't grow up. She put away her favorite toy, sat in front of a mirror, and faced her youthful reflection. She made a momentous decision, using her scant savings to get a permit to sell flowers at the market. From dawn till dusk, she covered every corner of Nino Rich. One day, she met a kind stranger who not only bought many flowers from her but also offered her a good job. Aina always expressed her gratitude to God whenever she could. The day she received her first wages, ten silver coins, was monumental. Even the way she would spend it had been thought out long ago. For Aina, this amount of money was so vast that it was the first time she had seen so much in her possession. Despite facing hardships from a young age, Aina retained her simple, trusting nature. When a group of travelers claimed to possess a miracle cure-all, Aina, without a hint of doubt, spent all her savings on it, hoping it would heal her mother. But no miracle occurred, her mother's condition remained unchanged. This left Aina in despair, clueless about how to cure her mother's illness. She realized that money was the key, only with enough funds could she take her mother to a city for proper treatment. Thus, Aina turned to Shiro, hoping he could save her from this predicament. She was willing to endure any hardship, to undertake even the most grueling tasks, if only it would help her mother recover. Contrary to Aina's expectations, Shiro did not take advantage of her desperation. Instead, he offered a gentle smile and tenderly patted her head, indicating his understanding of her struggles. Liar, however, could not maintain such composure. Enraged, he punched a wall, venting his anger. Furious at the charlatan who sold fake medicine to Aina, he vowed to find him and deliver not ten but a hundred punches as retribution. Nesca tried to calm Liar, preventing further destruction. Rolf, more direct, approached Aina and explained that the medicine she had bought was a scam, it could not cure her mother's illness. He mentioned that while there are medicines for detoxification and wound healing, no cure-all exists in the world. Aina, still clinging to a sliver of hope, argued that the travelers had assured her the medicine would improve her mother's condition. Rolf patiently told her that she had been deceived. Aina fell silent, the realization that she had been duped echoing in her mind. Tears welled up in her eyes as she lamented the waste of her long-saved money, all for a deceitful lie. Shiro, unable to bear the sight of her distress, looked away. Meanwhile, Liar's rage was uncontainable. In a fit of anger, he kicked a glass door, shattering it. He then announced to Rolf his intention to seek revenge on the deceitful charlatan, leaving the matters at hand to Rolf. Kilfa and Nesca volunteered to join him on this quest for justice. While Liar and his group set off in search of the deceitful man, Shiro, Karen, and Rolf visit Aina's mother. On their way to the young girl's home, Shiro learns from Rolf about the grave illness afflicting Aina's mother, known as decay, a term apparently used by some duplicitous travelers. Rolf explains that this illness causes the limbs to rot, gradually sapping the strength of the afflicted, and it's often terminal. The scholars aren't certain about its infectious nature or the reasons behind it. Arriving at Aina's house, they are struck by the realization that the little girl takes this lengthy path every day. The air is filled with a somber silence as Aina, brimming with enthusiasm, opens the door to greet her mother, pulling Shiro inside. In the small house, they find a simple room with a bed and a few essential items. Lying there is a thin, frail woman, Aina's mother, Stella. She introduces herself to Shiro, expressing her gratitude for all the help he has provided to Aina. Stella tries to sit up, feeling it's improper to remain in bed while having guests, but Shiro gently insists that she should lie down and rest. Aina points out another woman in the room, revealing her to be the town's mayor. Stella is visibly surprised, questioning why the mayor would visit their humble home. Rolf steps in to explain that they've come to visit upon hearing about her illness. Stella apologizes for the inconvenience, but Karen, the mayor, insists that she is the one who should be apologizing, expressing her regret for not being able to do more for her citizens. Stella counters, saying that they should be thankful to the town for accepting outsiders like them. She is pleasantly surprised to hear about the number of friends Aina has made, such as Shiro, Mayor Karen, Uncle Rolf, and others not present there. Stella is delighted for Aina, feeling relieved and grateful for her daughter's fortunate social connections.
Guessing that her mother might be hungry, Aina decides to cook a meal. She takes it upon herself to make soup for everyone, with Rolf lending a helping hand in the kitchen. As the room empties, leaving only Karen, Shiro, and Stella, Stella softly requests a private word with Shiro. With only Shiro and Stella left in the room, Stella finally voices her deep-seated request, albeit a bit imposing, she asks Shiro if he could take care of Aina after her passing. Shiro is visibly shocked by Stella's unexpected plea. She continues, apologizing for her abruptness but explaining that her time is running short, and she presumes Shiro has heard about her illness from Aina. Stella inquires if Aina cried when talking about her. Shiro, hesitantly, confirms that she did. Stella's expression grows more somber, she knows Aina must have cried. Despite trying her hardest, Aina feels powerless in her inability to save her mother. Stella, feeling responsible as Aina's mother, regrets not being able to care for her properly and is even more distressed knowing there were times when Aina forced herself to smile just to avoid worrying her. But recently, something changed. Aina genuinely smiled whenever she spoke of Shiro, a kind-hearted brother figure she was fortunate to find. Stella now understands why, feeling that Shiro reminds her of Aina's father. She confesses that upon first seeing Shiro, she was startled, almost believing her long-lost partner had returned. Shiro, taken aback, apologizes to Stella. She gently shakes her head, revealing that her memories of her husband were fading, but Shiro's presence helped her vividly recall his face, comforting her with the thought that it might be easier to find him in the afterlife, a journey she believes is not far off. Gathering her strength, Stella shakily stands and moves toward Shiro, her feet trembling, barely able to support her. She pleads with him to look after Aina, fearing the young girl's vulnerability and inevitable tears, at just eight years old, Aina would be lost without her. As Stella's body reaches its limit and she collapses in front of Shiro, he quickly catches her, reassuring her, and gently places her back on the bed. Shiro then makes an unusual request, he asks for permission to touch Stella's leg. Although surprised and somewhat embarrassed, Stella, trusting that he means no harm, closes her eyes and agrees. Faced with Stella sitting on the bed, Shiro kneels before her, gently lifting and examining her leg. It seems he might know what this illness is. With a look of joy, Shiro excitedly tells Stella that he might have discovered the cause and cure for the decay disease. His uncle had symptoms even worse than hers, but now he's completely healthy. Shiro believes he can cure Stella. Hearing this, Stella bursts into tears. The pain and suffering she has endured for years are indescribable. Grasping Shiro's hand tightly, she admits she isn't ready to die, not wanting to leave Aina alone in this world. Hope sparkles in Shiro's eyes as he reassuringly holds Stella's hand. At that moment, the door opens. Karen peeks in to check if their conversation is over, mentioning that Aina and Rolf have finished preparing the meal. Shiro stiffens, turning to face the three people at the door, aware of how intimate his and Stella's position might appear. Recalling the scene, Shiro feels a headache brewing, grateful for Stella's clear explanation that saves him from any misunderstanding. After lunch, Shiro conducts a lecture about the decay disease. Pointing to a human silhouette on a board, he explains that in his homeland, the disease is known as beriberi, caused by a nutritional deficiency. It's a terrifying disease because it can lead to paralysis, but it's also easily curable with proper vitamin intake. Aina excitedly asks if the cure really exists, something that could save her mother's life. Shiro confirms its existence. He then steps outside, opens a portal between two worlds, and enters a room with his grandmother's altar. Kneeling down, he remembers his grandmother's words, her wish for him to help those in need within his means. Shiro then converts foreign currency into Japanese money using an equivalent exchange. Some time later, Shiro hands a box of medicine to Stella, explaining that although the pills might look strange, they can cure the decay. Karen and Rolf are skeptical about the safety of these orange pills. Stella guesses they must be expensive, but Shiro assures her not to worry, stating his repayment plan is Aina's smile. Ever since Shiro arrived in the town, Aina had been of great help to him, and now it was his turn to assist her. Overcome with emotion, Aina's tears fell as she clung to Shiro's hand. A month later, during another visit to Stella's house, Aina and Shiro were delighted to find that Stella could now take a few steps. Aina, her voice trembling with emotion, 
asked her mother if she was able to walk again. Stella was indeed getting stronger each day, recovery was only a matter of time. Aina, barely able to contain her emotions, asked Stella if she could sleep beside her now that she was better. Stella, with a mix of reluctance and affection, agreed, promising they would sleep together that night. Aina, unable to hold back any longer, ran to her mother, embracing her tightly and crying. It had been so long since she could hug her mother with such force, probably not since the onset of the illness. From now on, they would always be together. Shiro, deeply moved by the scene, felt tears welling up in his eyes. Quietly closing the door to give mother and daughter privacy, he stepped outside. He could now proudly tell his grandmother that he had succeeded in helping others within his capabilities. She would undoubtedly be proud of him. Shiro sat on the balcony of the building, contemplating the events of the past two months on this beautiful day. Aina's mother had fully recovered after taking the vitamin supplements. Aina was ecstatic, sharing that they had stayed up late talking, which led to little sleep. Her mother had cooked vegetable soup and many other dishes, and Aina had picked flowers for her. They even had a funny face competition, making each other laugh. Shiro couldn't help but laugh out loud, delighted to see Aina so happy. This was how an eight-year-old girl should be. Moreover, the Silver Moon Society had officially joined the Fairy Spell Association as a branch, leading the Azure Sky team to operate under its banner. More travelers were appearing, eager to explore the vast forest. Finally, Shiro had earned nearly 500 million yen in the past two months. At this rate, he mused, he might be able to retire after just a year of hard work. While lost in thought about the day he wouldn't have to work anymore, Shiro didn't notice Karen sneaking up behind him. She playfully asked what was about to happen. Startled, Shiro turned around to find the smiling mayor greeting him warmly, asking what he was drinking. He told her it was a special liquor from his hometown and offered her a taste. Karen couldn't refuse, and soon both of them were tipsy, laughing heartily. Shiro, his face flushed, ended up resting his head on Karen's lap. Karen, seemingly inebriated, began to speak from the heart, thanking Shiro for everything he had done for the town. She earnestly told him that if he ever needed anything, he shouldn't hesitate to ask. Shiro sat up, insisting that what he did was simply what he should do and there was no need for thanks. He grew up with his grandmother, who taught him to always help those in need, and when in trouble, others would stand by him. Karen admired Shiro's values and curiously inquired about his grandmother's name. Shiro, smiling, revealed it was Arisu Gawamio. Karen repeated the name, then shockingly asked if Shiro was the grandson of the immortal witch Arisu. Shiro was surprised to hear that Karen knew of her. Karen explained that Arisu was a well-known figure across the continent, but rare were those who had seen her in person. Karen had encountered the witch during last year's harvest festival, where Arisu appeared drunk, dancing joyfully in the town. She recalled how Arisu had performed the Melkipson star spell, created from the star fragments she had collected, under a clear sky. Shiro gestured for Karen to pause, needing a moment to absorb this flood of information. He remembered reading in a book left by his grandmother about a witch named Rufuatio from eighty years ago, which must have been around the time his grandmother was born. Karen, intrigued, asked what he thought about the Melkipson spell. Shiro recollected his childhood memories of his grandmother showing him pictures of her favorite actor, Melkipson. This could explain the mysterious spell, then, the person behind it was his grandmother. Karen continued, expressing her surprise that Shiro's grandmother was the famous witch, no wonder he had so many unusual items. Shiro mentioned it had been seven years since he last saw her. Moving to the balcony railing, Shiro yelled out loudly that his grandmother was still alive, his voice echoing off the mountain in affirmation. The day before, after learning that the witch Arisu was his grandmother, she had disappeared without leaving any information. Karen knew Shiro wanted to see her immediately but advised waiting until the harvest festival, as the witch often appeared at its conclusion. This year marked the festival's 120th anniversary, and Karen planned to make it special. With two months to go, she asked Shiro for help with some festival preparations. Shiro, fond of the festival, put aside his search for his grandmother and immediately agreed to help Karen. He pondered potential business opportunities for the festival day. Food stalls seemed abundant already, and typical attractions like raffles, goldfish scooping, and target shooting might not draw much attention. Perhaps he should consider a food booth. 
Frustrated, Shiro racked his brain for childhood memories that might spark an idea. Then, it struck him, he had an idea. The next day, several cameras were laid out on a table, piquing Aina's curiosity. Shiro explained that these were cameras, a wonderful invention he had prepared. Seeing her confusion, he demonstrated how they worked by taking a photo of Aina. The camera clicked, and he showed her the resulting image. Aina was initially shocked, stuttering in disbelief, wondering if she had been shrunk and trapped inside. Shiro smiled, explaining that the camera was like a magic item, capturing images instantly. He took several more photos of her, which she delightedly examined. Aina then tried taking a picture of Shiro, and despite being her first time, she took a beautiful photo, much to his liking. Aina pointed to a device nearby and asked what it was. Shiro explained that it was a Polaroid camera, which left Aina marveling at its variety. To test it out, Shiro snapped a picture of Aina when she was not paying attention, capturing a funny expression on her face. In a playful revenge, Aina started taking unflattering pictures of Shiro, which is also a fun feature of this type of camera. Looking at the photo, Shiro thought of his grandmother, amused by the saying, like grandparent, like grandchild. Their playful moment was interrupted when Stella entered the room, smiling radiantly and thanking Shiro for taking care of Aina all day. Aina rushed to hug her mother, asking if she was tired from cleaning. Recently, they had been living in a house Shiro rented to them, just a ten-minute walk from his shop. Aina playfully accused her mother of being a terrible cleaner, making Stella laugh shyly. Shiro offered his help, prompting Aina to hesitantly admit that Shiro wasn't great at cleaning either. Now, two embarrassed individuals were in the room. After their meal, they said their goodbyes. Shiro headed back to his shop, promising to meet them again the next day. The Silver Moon Adventurers had joined the Fairies Blessing Association as a branch. The days of quiet at the association were long gone, in just two months, they had become some of the busiest people in the Kingdom of Gilarm. Shiro visited the Silver Moon base. As soon as he entered, Emil spotted him and waved, teasingly asking if he had come to see her or to give her an expensive gift. Shiro rolled his eyes at Emil's remarks, explaining he was there only because they had planned to have dinner together. But Emil seemed to have other ideas. Caught in her own fantasy, she declared she was ready to be his wife any time, imagining them riding noble dragons and scattering coins. As she spoke, she began unbuttoning her shirt, prompting Shiro to panic and yell at her to stop. Emil, undeterred, climbed over the table with a longing look in her eyes. It was now lunchtime, and Emil seemed to have some ideas about spending it in a certain way. Shiro found himself cornered against a wall with no escape, forcing him to grab Emil's hands and push her away. Everyone present seemed too used to Emil's behavior to intervene. Emil pressed close to Shiro, her lips puckered, leaving Shiro sweating in horror. Just as Shiro thought he was about to lose his first kiss, a savior appeared. Kilfa flew in with a kick, instantly separating them. Shiro was so relieved he almost cried, and even at the dinner table in Kilfa's bar, Kilfa had to comfort him. The full moon season was approaching, making the rabbits more restless than usual. Rolf and Neska didn't see it that way, insisting that Emil's forced advances on Shiro weren't signs of a healthy relationship. Shiro nearly got coerced into something he didn't want. Seeing Emil happily sitting at the dining table, Shiro angrily asked why she couldn't stay away from him. Naturally, nobody wanted to be left alone. At this moment, an argument broke out at the next table, quickly escalating into a physical fight. Instead of intervening, the bystanders started betting on who would win. Shiro was about to step in to stop the fight, but Liar held him back. Fighting was commonplace among adventurers, as they were the best from all over, gathered here in search of ancient relics. Since the place became a branch of the Fairies Blessing Association two months ago, there had been no significant fines, leading to growing frustrations. In Nino Rich, where there were no outlets for entertainment or venting anger, brawls were common. Just as the fight was about to be resolved, the door opened and guild leader Enna entered with a commanding presence. She coldly announced that no one was allowed to cause trouble in her association. Everyone dispersed upon hearing this, and the two fighters stopped and left in annoyance. Nei, noticing Shiro's table, came over to greet him. After Nei's stern change of expression, she turned to Emil, who was hiding under the table, and demanded to know why she didn't stop the fight. 
Without waiting for an explanation, NEI dragged Emil away for a private reprimand. With the area finally quiet, Lyre revealed an important matter to Shiro, last week, their group had encountered an unusual flower that they had never seen before and thought Shiro might know something about it. Shiro suggested they go together to the location of the flower for a closer examination, provided the group ensured his protection from any beasts. Lyre firmly agreed, asserting that their group was much more capable now. They raised their glasses to celebrate their collaboration. Shiro joined the Azure Sky Group on an expedition into the forest in search of the strange flower. They arrived at a meadow full of fresh flowers, lying down to enjoy the serene, picturesque setting. Shiro regretted that Aina wasn't there to see it, knowing how much she loved unique flora. As Nesca was about to take a nap right there, Lyre urged everyone to get moving before sunset, suggesting they could rest as much as they wanted afterwards. A week earlier, the group had discovered a flower called Apsara while searching for relics. It was a rare ingredient for crafting high-level recovery potions. They had harvested some, but within just a few hours on their way back, all the flowers wilted. Nesca tried to keep them in water and maintain a stable temperature with magic, but to no avail, they couldn't get the flowers to an alchemist in time. Just when the group was about to give up, Lyre remembered Shiro's storage space, which could carry things without burden and suspend the time of items inside. Fortuitously, Lyre's trust in Shiro was well placed, as he indeed could help them. After securing enough flowers, the group suddenly sensed something amiss. Something was approaching them, and in large numbers. It was a swarm of flies with wounds on their backs. Rolf speculated, based on the amount of blood loss, that the flies had just fought a formidable enemy. Without further deliberation, Lyre ordered Rolf to protect Shiro while Nesca swiftly launched fire spells. The flies had discovered the group and launched a ferocious attack. Shiro ran behind Rolf for protection, while Nesca and Kilfa worked together effectively. Noticing the monster's fear of fire, Shiro daringly ran to the front and pulled out a pepper spray can from his bag. Rolf, seeing this, advised him to stop, explaining that pepper spray would be ineffective. However, Shiro had another plan in mind. By placing a flame in front of the pepper spray and aiming it at the monsters, he could create a makeshift flamethrower. Rolf, surprised by Shiro's ingenuity, swiftly killed a weakened fly with a slash of his sword, splattering blood everywhere, causing even Lyre to turn his head in admiration of Shiro's tactic. Only six flies remained, and Shiro was confident they would overcome this challenge. But the situation took a dangerous turn when the two largest flies attacked Nesca. Unable to repeat his previous tactic without harming Nesca, Shiro ran to shield her. As expected, one of the flies slashed Shiro with its sharp legs. Following Lyre's shout, Shiro ran towards a nearby river, ignoring the monster still clinging to him, and jumped in. The last fly finally released him, but the river was deep, and Shiro didn't know how to swim. He began to sink, leaving only his hand visible above the water's surface. Lyre shouted loudly, promising to search for Shiro along the riverbank. Unaware if Shiro heard him, Shiro eventually woke up in a blurry state. Gasping and coughing up water, he saw a strange girl before him. She seemed annoyed by his curious gaze, presuming he had never seen a fairy before. When she revealed herself as a fairy, Shiro immediately became alert, seeing a fairy for the first time. The tiny, irritated fairy was embarrassed by his staring. She questioned why Shiro had fallen into the water, noting that she saved him from becoming fish food. Shiro, bewildered, recounted the entire incident to the fairy. After listening, she couldn't help but laugh heartily at the absurdity of Shiro's predicament. When Shiro mentioned he was from Nino Rich, a human town, the girl expressed a desire to accompany him. Curious, Shiro asked why, and she bashfully revealed she had a close friend there. Describing him as slightly shorter and frilier than Shiro but always cheerful, with sky-blue eyes and hair, she asked if Shiro knew him. Shiro, scratching his head in confusion, pointed out that without a name, it would be hard to identify anyone, as many people could fit that description. Unfortunately, she didn't know his name, only referring to him as, human, since he was the only human she had ever met. She speculated he might be an adventurer or hunter since they had met in the forest while hunting monsters. Shiro found their forest meeting quite romantic and asked if they were lovers. 
Embarrassed, she quickly clarified they were just friends, or perhaps a bit more, insisting that fairies and humans couldn't be in love. Shiro guessed they must be best friends and inquired if she knew the forest well. Proudly, she confirmed she grew up in Jigaina Forest. Shiro decided to bring her to Nino Rich on the condition that she guide him through the northern forest. After a moment of surprise, she agreed, promising to protect him until they reached their destination. Demonstrating her skill, she performed a wind slice, effortlessly felling several large trees with a simple move that was too fast to see. While Shiro turned pale, Patty shyly admitted she wasn't very good at controlling her strength, but it was fine as long as she was powerful. She had just chased off a swarm of flies from the area. Shiro realized the enemy that had injured those monster flies was none other than Patty. Introducing himself, Shiro learned her name was Patty Falulu. As she declared herself the leader of their journey, Shiro playfully suggested calling her boss instead, which Patty happily accepted. Excitedly, Shiro yelled, Yes, boss, making Patty blush. He jokingly added that he could even act like those who flatter their female bosses. Seeing Patty's displeasure, Shiro jokingly suggested acting like a gang boss, but she didn't like that either. So, he proposed they play as a king and servant. They spent the evening playing and joking, and before they knew it, it was night. Sitting by the fire, Shiro shared stories about his friends with Patty. She asked if he really wanted to return, and of course, Shiro did. His teammates were probably looking for him. Patty resolved to help Shiro find his friends, moved by his obvious concern for them. Considering their boss employee relationship, Patty asked if Shiro was hungry and then casually opened her personal space. Shiro was astonished to see she had a storage space just like his. Patty munched on an apple while searching inside her space. Seeing Shiro's continued surprise, she assumed he had never seen a storage space before. Fairies like her had many skills, and such a space wasn't rare for them. Finally, Patty pulled out a gourd bottle and handed it to Shiro, saying it would warm him up. Shiro didn't hesitate to take a big gulp, delighted by the taste. Seeing his enjoyment, Patty tasked him with finishing the drink before sleeping, promising to keep watch for the night. The bottle seemed to contain sweet liquor, and Shiro, slightly tipsy, thanked the fairy and drifted off to sleep. The next morning, as dawn broke, Petty perched on Shiro's head, guiding him towards the northern forest. She chattered non-stop about various fairy species like shepherd fairies, demon fairies, and a powerful elf fairy in a nearby village. Shiro, exhausted, gasped for air and asked his boss if they could take a break. Patty, slightly annoyed with Shiro's weakness, agreed to rest. However, only Shiro rested. Patty continued to buzz around, lecturing about the peculiar babuna flower beside them, once confusing it with another species. Shiro sighed, summarizing Patty's endless stories in his mind. Apparently, long before Patty was born, there used to be a kingdom named Jigaina in this area. The kingdom had long since fallen, now turned into the Jigaina forest. He curiously asked Petty if that kingdom existed in the era of ancient magic. But she didn't know either, she hadn't been born yet at that time. Suddenly, the sound of footsteps echoed. Sensing it was human, Petty instructed him to hide immediately, and both concealed themselves in the bushes behind them. The voices grew louder, and soon, four figures appeared, frantically searching for Shiro. Especially Liar, who was crying and calling out for Shiro, hoping he hadn't fallen off the waterfall and died. Nesca, standing beside, hit him with a stone, scolding him not to jinx it. Liar, undeterred, looked up with a sniffle and asked her if Shiro was still alive. Nesca smiled, patting Liar's head reassuringly, while Kilfa bounced around in search, confident that Shiro was alive. Meanwhile, Shiro, hiding nearby, wanted to rush out and call them. The fairy beside him disagreed with this decision, chastising Shiro for making noise. Shiro smiled at Petty, reassuring her that they were his good friends and teammates. He then shouted to signal his location and ran towards the group. The group rejoiced at finding Shiro, but Kilfa was now nowhere to be seen. She had been snatched away by a large bird, and in excitement upon spotting Shiro, Kilfa struggled and kicked until the bird released her. Plummeting down, Shiro managed to catch her. The cat-like girl lay on top of him, crying tears of relief, fearing she had lost him. After calming down, both quickly got up. 
The other three ran over, starting with Liar apologizing, lamenting their failure to protect Shiro from monsters as promised. Nesca thanked him for saving her, vowing to return the favor. Shiro felt overwhelmed by the group's concern, turning to tell them that now he was safe and reunited with his team, the past ordeal didn't matter anymore. He questioned if they didn't consider him a team member with all their formalities. They all shouted in unison that it wasn't the case. Shiro continued, revealing it was a miracle he survived, saved by someone else. Then, he pointed towards his savior, hiding behind a tree trunk, named Petty. Seeing the tiny figure hovering in the air, the group was skeptical. Nesca's face was filled with caution as she mentioned that fairies are so rarely seen that they are considered figments of imagination. Fairies, she said, would never allow ordinary people to see them. Surprised, Shiro turned to ask Petty about this. Petty admitted that even after leaving their village, they were still bound by rules and swiftly hid behind Shiro's head. Hearing about a group called the Fairies' Blessing, Petty angrily questioned why fairies should bless humans. Shiro laughed, saying he wasn't sure about that but maybe in other places, some fairies do such things. Hearing their conversation, the group explained that, the fairy's blessing referred to a legendary fairy made honey wine. Shiro instantly remembered the sweet, delicious drink Petty had once given him. Nesca, upon hearing he had tasted this wine, was shocked and grabbed his shirt to confirm. Not only Nesca, but everyone was surprised to learn that Shiro had tasted the fairy's honey wine. Liar exclaimed that the wine was so valuable that a small glass could buy a castle, and the last sale recorded was 200 years ago. Shiro was finally scared, while Petty casually mentioned she gave him the wine simply because he was her subordinate. As the group grew curious about the subordinate superior relationship, Shiro had to explain the whole story. Learning the fairy's name was Petty, everyone greeted her warmly. Liar, with a friendly gaze, thanked Petty for saving Shiro and offered help if she ever needed it. Suddenly, Shiro recalled something and continued Liar's offer, mentioning that the fairy was looking for a friend. They could take this opportunity to repay her. Liar asked who they were looking for. Shiro described the person as having blue eyes and hair, possibly a hunter or an astronaut, which puzzled everyone. But he reassured them that they would eventually find this person. Now that everyone was reunited, they set off on their journey back to Nino Rich. After a day's journey, as they neared their destination, Petty spotted the cityscape from afar and excitedly pointed it out to Shiro as a human village. Nesca corrected her, saying it was a city, and explained how such places are categorized by size. Petty seemed quite fascinated, perching on Shiro's head and urging him to move faster. The group laughed heartily, joking about the hardships of being her subordinate. Entering the city, Shiro saw a figure waiting in the distance, Aina, with a worried expression, waiting for his return. Overwhelmed with relief upon seeing him, she ran and hugged him tightly, tears streaming down her face. Stella, her mother, appeared shortly after, saying that Aina had been unable to sleep the previous night, worried about him facing dangers on the road. They all continued towards their home, evidently exhausted from the lack of rest. Aina dozed off on her mother's shoulder, looking tired. Shiro asked Stella if she was okay. Despite heavy breathing, Stella insisted on carrying her daughter, believing she could manage a little longer. Shiro understood and reminded her to let him know if it became too much. Aina, normally considerate, was just too fatigued, otherwise, she wouldn't have let her mother, who had recently recovered from an illness, carry her. After escorting them home, Shiro returned to his place. Entering his house, Petty excitedly flew up high, admiring its size, and Shiro inquired how fairies lived. Petty explained that they built homes high up in trees, safe from monsters. She playfully nudged his shoulder, reminding him of their mission. Shiro reassured her that they would surely find her friend in the small city, planning to start their search the next day. Remembering the honey wine, Shiro asked if it was difficult to make. Petty thought it was easy, needing only honey, but getting the honey was the hard part. She recounted being stung by a swarm of bees just to get a little. Shiro rummaged in his bag and presented a jar to Petty, asking if it would suffice. At first, Petty couldn't comprehend what it was, but upon realizing, she exclaimed and stared intently at the jar of honey, almost popping her eyes out. Shiro explained it was 100% pure honey from a bee farm, but Petty, skeptical, tasted it with her finger. A second later, her face lit up with delight, 
using this ingredient could create the finest wines. Shiro, too, was happy to hear this but was too tired to stay awake any longer. He crashed on the couch for a dreamless sleep, drooling along with the fairy. The next morning, not even the loudest bird chirping could wake Shiro. When he finally opened his eyes, he was greeted by Aina's face. Shiro was puzzled by her presence since his shop was still closed. Aina explained her mother sent her to bring lunch, and noticing the tiny fairy on his head, her eyes sparkled as she reached out to gently pick up the fairy. Shiro introduced Aina as his store's employee. After lunch, the three of them went out to the balcony to catch some fresh air. Seizing the opportunity, Petty asked Aina if she knew a boy with blue eyes and hair. Aina's ignorance made Petty's face fall with disappointment. Shiro comforted her, saying it was impossible for Aina to know everyone in town. Besides, they could ask around the small town. Soon, with their bags packed, the three set off to find the person, with Aina assisting but first, they needed to figure out how to conceal Petty. Aina had prepared a small backpack, and their search began. Shiro asked everyone they met about Petty's friend, from street vendors to doctors, astronauts, and even a kebab shop owner, but no one knew of the mysterious boy. They even inquired with the local government office manager, a parrot and a thief, asking a total of 27 people, but still no clues. Aina suggested that maybe the boy didn't live in Ninorich, but Petty insisted her friend had said he was on his way there. The only clue they had was Petty's necklace, a photo of which Shiro had taken earlier. As the trio sat under a tree to rest, Karen appeared out of nowhere, panting. Her first concern was whether Shiro was injured, having heard that he ventured into the forest with the Light of Heaven group. Learning that he was unharmed, Karen playfully patted Shiro's head, making him blush. To hide his embarrassment, Shiro showed her the photo of the necklace. Karen pondered over it, feeling she had seen it before but couldn't recall where exactly. She promised to inform them if she remembered and hurried off for urgent business with her group. Shiro's curiosity peaked, Karen's expression turned grim as she mentioned the Light of Heaven group's failure to fully protect her friend, causing him danger. Shiro tried to stop her, but it was too late, Karen had already disappeared down the road. He hoped that Liar and the others would be safe from any repercussions. Just then, Aina proposed to have a sleepover with Petty that night. Shiro asked Petty for her opinion, and despite her initial reluctance, she agreed to the heartfelt invitation. After a day of fruitless searching, everyone went their separate ways. Aina, with Petty discreetly tucked in her backpack, headed home to find her mother waiting. She excitedly hinted at a secret to show her mother, who agreed with surprise and delight. Stella was then greeted by the sight of a miniaturized person. Petty commented on how Aina and her mother had identical eyes. Initially startled, Stella soon adapted to the idea of hosting a fairy in her home. She brought in tea and snacks for their distinguished guest. Petty was thrilled to experience a soft mattress for the first time. As they sat and chatted, Stella inquired about the boy Petty was searching for, and Aina showed keen interest too. After a moment of reflection, Petty recounted her first time leaving the village and encountering a human. She recalled how the boy's childish behavior made her burst into laughter. Petty had been observing the boy from above, initially laughing at his plight. But as his tears grew more desperate, her heart softened, and she decided to intervene. The boy, upon witnessing her magic, stood frozen, asking in awe if she was a fairy. This marked the beginning of their unique acquaintance. Petty helped him deal with the rabbit, and the boy, with surprising efficiency, cooked and eagerly consumed the meat, repeatedly exclaiming its exceptional taste. Petty initially thought there was something odd about human taste buds, but she soon realized the truth, the boy was famished, having not eaten a decent meal in over ten days. His gratitude towards Petty was evident after he had his fill, and he curiously inquired about her name. She playfully responded that she would tell him once he became a proficient hunter. Time gently swept by, and the once clumsy boy evolved into a competent hunter, skillfully wielding a bow and arrow to hunt larger, faster prey. When the day came for him to inquire about her name again, Petty hesitated, her mind clouded with memories of past rejections. She dodged the question, promising to reveal it another time, and the boy, understanding her hesitance, didn't insist. Sadly, that was their final meeting. Both lonely in their own ways, they found comfort in each other's company, drawn together by a mutual sense of solitude. 
Hetty made a silent vow that upon their next encounter, she would not only reveal her name but also learn his. As she concluded her story, Hetty let out a self-conscious giggle, apologizing to Stella and Aina for what she thought was a tedious tale. Then, she felt unexpected droplets on her head. Startled, she thought the roof was leaking, but when she looked up, she saw Aina with tears streaming down her face, deeply touched by the story. Aina expressed her belief that Petty and her friend were destined to reunite, a sentiment that moved Petty deeply. In a different scene, Shiro, after having spent over two hours in a shower in the modern world, returned to Nino Rich to relish the sunset. He noticed Liar downstairs, who was waving at him despite having a noticeably swollen face. Surprised, Shiro asked about the swelling. Liar managed a weak smile and explained that it was a consequence of the mayor's reprimand for his decision to take Shiro into the forest. The disapproval from the mayor was clear, as she did not support Liar's actions. Liar, unexpectedly, swung his arm without holding back and landed a solid blow to the face, causing a shock that nearly popped his eyes out. His purpose today was to invite Shiro for a beer at the society's bar, where the head of the society and Emil would also be. Shiro agreed, quickly changed his clothes, and joined them at the arranged spot. Everyone raised their glasses in celebration, joyfully sipping their beers. Shiro tried a big gulp but didn't seem to enjoy it much. Any I guessed that Shiro didn't find this particular beer tasty. Shiro, scratching his head awkwardly, was taken aback. Any I laughed, admitting she didn't find it great either. She explained that the variety of drinks available in the border areas was limited, and although some travelers had requested the society to introduce better options, the cost was a significant hurdle. Emil, slightly tipsy, wished they had wine or cider, even though they were sour and not particularly tasty, but at least smelled nice. Shiro misunderstood this, thinking sour equated to bad. Liar jokingly asked Shiro if he had never drunk alcohol before, saying a successful businessman like him would only drink noble wines. Shiro countered that back home, there were many affordable yet delicious wines, categorized into three types, red, white, and rose. Recently, orange wine had also become popular, and there were various variants of each type. These ranged from sweet to bitter, with some being light and easy to drink, while others were more robust, with complex flavors. Prices varied widely, from cheap ones affordable for kids to ones as expensive as a house. Some people were so passionate about wine that they paired different types with each meal. However, Shiro personally preferred sake, which also came in three main types, Jinju sake, also known as rice wine, Junmai sake, or sugarless, non-alcoholic rice wine, and Hanju sake, a sugarless variety. As he mentioned this, Shiro suddenly stopped speaking. Everyone's eyes were fixed on him, eagerly waiting for him to continue. Even those who were previously engaged in a noisy brawl had momentarily paused and turned their attention to Shiro, with some urging him to go on. Swallowing nervously, Shiro stated that there were so many varieties in his homeland that one could choose to drink any type. Immediately, alcohol enthusiasts gathered around Shiro with eyes shining in anticipation. Although it was a bit sudden, Shiro sensed a golden business opportunity. If successful, this venture could be like hitting three birds with one arrow. He loudly garnered everyone's attention in the society, announcing a significant decision. In three days, right here, Shiro would host a tasting of wines from his homeland. Today, Aina had switched her usual dress for a server's outfit. This change even earned her praise from Meyer. They were to help at the society's bar, and despite initial objections due to Aina's age, her persistence paid off, and Stella agreed to accompany her. Nesca and Kilfa also donned uniforms, with Nesca's ice magic proving useful for chilling beverages. Shiro, the bar's manager, expressed his gratitude for their assistance, offering them each a bottle of their choice as a reward. Kilfa chose a fruit wine, while Nesca opted for a cicula-flavored liquor. When Aina was asked, she innocently requested grape juice. Outside, the public was clamoring and shouting, eager to get inside. The handsome Shiro stepped out to calm the crowd, expressing his gratitude for their relentless search efforts in the forest every day. As a token of appreciation, he announced he would open a selected wine booth at his shop today. The announcement was met with jubilant cheers, with some in the crowd too eager to wait for a taste of the exquisite offerings. Without further ado, Shiro declared the drinks on the house for the day, 
leading to a boisterous uproar in the hall. Shiro was momentarily anxious about the three million yen he had spent but reminded himself it was merely an investment. He introduced Nei, who had a few words to share with the crowd. She encouraged everyone to enjoy Shiro's fine wine but reminded them to work hard the next day. As everyone prepared to enjoy the drinks, the event descended into chaos before Shiro could even pour the first glass, with people pushing and shoving from behind. Nei quickly stepped in to resolve the situation. Her eerily cheerful yet hellish demeanor frightened everyone into orderly lines. Liar was next to choose a drink, and he picked a bottle of Sapari beer. Aina suggested adding a slice of lemon to enhance its flavor. Liar took a sip, and after a long draft, his eyes sparkled brightly, his face flushing red. The beer had a light fizz and the fruity touch further elevated its taste. He finished the rest of the glass in one go, putting it down with a satisfying clink, visibly content. Seeing his reaction, the people behind him continuously requested the same beer, praising its exquisite taste. On the other side, Stella and Aina were tirelessly serving the large number of drink orders. Meanwhile, Shiro was dealing with a customer who ordered the strongest liquor available. People around started whispering, recognizing the man as Erdos, one of the sixteen heroes, known as, the Undefeated. Shiro presented a bottle of Spiritus, renowned for its strength, almost feeling like it could burn the taste buds with its 96% alcohol content. He poured a small glass for the man. Erdos, holding the tiny glass, appeared disgruntled, remarking sarcastically about being treated like a child despite being a 200-year-old elf. Shiro, nearly panicking, exclaimed that wasn't his intention, assuring that the spiritus would surely make him dizzy. Erdos, however, seemed unimpressed, his face turning red with anger, accusing Shiro of trying to humiliate him. He boasted he had never been drunk in his life. The entire hall fell silent, listening to their conversation. Shiro continued to persuade the man to drink responsibly, warning that excessive drinking could be life-threatening. Erdos, finally getting the message, chose not to argue further. Instead, he tore off his shirt in a dramatic gesture, challenging Shiro to a fight outside to settle the matter. Everyone, including Shiro, gasped in shock, facing the prospect of a brawl with Erdos. Just as uncertainty about how to handle the situation arose, Rolf intervened. He introduced himself to Erdos as Rolf, a priest serving the Sky Lord Florine, aiming to defuse the tension. The man, still seething with anger, accused Rolf of provoking him as well. He argued that it was Shiro who had insulted him first, challenging the pride of an elf. Erdos emphatically stated that alcohol runs in their elvish blood by the barrel, not just a mere glass. Rolf remained calm, offering a proposal. As a priest, not only could he cure poison, but he also had a healing spell for drunkenness. Thus, if Erdos happened to get drunk, Rolf would be able to treat him immediately. Erdos added a bold wager, if he didn't get drunk, he'd earn the right to drink for free at the establishment for life. With this, he ordered Shiro to fill up his glass. Shiro complied, emptying the entire bottle of Spiritus into the glass. Erdos lifted the glass with the 96% alcohol content, sniffing it and commenting on its strong, overpowering scent, far more intense than any alcohol he had ever encountered. Without further delay, he downed the entire glass in one go. The crowd watched eagerly, waiting to see the outcome of this bet. After belching loudly, Erdos slammed the glass down and stared straight at Shiro, asking if he looked drunk. Shiro scratched his head, observing that Erdos appeared completely sober, seemingly conceding defeat. Erdos triumphantly laughed, looking forward to his lifetime of free drinks, but then suddenly felt a wave of dizziness and acute pain in his stomach. Within just two seconds, his towering figure collapsed to the ground, unconscious. The crowd was left in utter shock, unable to comprehend what had just happened. When Erdos woke up, his head was still buzzing, and he couldn't understand what had happened. Shiro stood beside him, imparting moral lessons to help him comprehend. Erdos would have been gone, cold as stone, if it weren't for Rolf's timely intervention in treatment. Even as a great hero, he couldn't withstand the power of alcohol. Erdos's subordinates, standing nearby, were utterly astonished. This was the first time someone dared to criticize him, and surprisingly, his first defeat was at the hands of alcohol. Everyone present was curious about this powerful wine, and due to its hard-to-remember name, unanimously decided to call it Hero Slayer. 
it didn't take long for this wine to become famous throughout the country. That day, everyone was so drunk, sprawled out on the floor. Nesca and Kilfa were delighted with the two types of wine they had chosen. Lyre, inebriated and babbling, felt a bit embarrassed as they were drinking for free that day. Shiro thought the price they paid was too low for such an addictive experience for travelers. Lyre, chuckling, commented that it was typical of an experienced merchant. A few people even got into fights, but since it wasn't life-threatening, no one intervened, reasoning they just wanted to relieve stress. Kilfa, hearing the conversation between the two, jumped up, patting Lyre on the back, praising him as a good person. However, Lyre understood that Shiro must have had an ulterior motive. He had seen a suspicious fairy hiding in that wooden barrel. Knowing he could no longer keep it a secret, Shiro picked up the barrel and called his boss, asking if she had seen the person she was looking for. Petty, sitting inside, replied sadly that she hadn't and felt guilty for troubling him with such tasks. Shiro wanted to comfort her but didn't know what to say. The day ended without them finding the boss's friend, even after asking around about the necklace countless times and even posting drawings and descriptions of the traveler. There was a moment when Petty thought her friend might have left Nina rich, but Shiro and Aina reassured her that there were still many people living outside, maybe 10, 20, or even 30. Petty grew even more desperate, realizing how difficult it would be to find one person in such a large crowd. At that moment, a voice calling for Shiro is heard outside the door. Karen enters, holding a peculiar box in her hand. The words Karen is about to speak seem to instill hope in everyone, especially Petty. She had searched her house after Shiro showed her the photo of the necklace. Karen found it, the necklace belonging to her great-great-grandfather, the first mayor of Nino Rich. Aina, surprised, asks Shiro about his great-great-grandfather. Shiro simply explains that it's the grandfather of his grandfather. Karen wonders why he was looking for her ancestor. Suddenly, Petty admits that she was the one who asked Shiro. Shocked to see a fairy, Karen turns to Shiro, puzzled about what is happening. After grasping the full story, she can't believe her great-great-grandfather knew a fairy. Without much ado, Petty inquires about his current whereabouts. When Karen doesn't respond, Petty presses further, bewildered as to how she doesn't know the location of her own ancestor. She argues that being family, one ought to know where their relatives are. Karen, momentarily lost in thought, then realizes the issue. She asks Petty about the lifespan of fairies. Without hesitation, the fairy reveals they live around 3,000 years, and she's only 300. Shiro's expression darkens as he too understands something. Karen continues, saying humans can't even live past 100 years. In other words, the person Petty is looking for has long passed away. Upon hearing this, Petty collapses, eyes wide in disbelief. She recalls her past, the scorn, the ridicule, no one wanting her there, no one caring for her. Even her parents despised her, nobody would care even if she died. That's why, on a moonless, starless night, Petty broke the rules and left the village. But then, she met him. It was the first time someone looked at Petty with such kindness. He thanked her for her help. It was the first time someone smiled at her, played with her, fought with her. Everything was a first. He showed Petty what happiness was, that there were people in the world who loved her, that she wasn't a worthless shooting star. She understood that no matter how dangerous it was out there, as long as he had even the faintest breath left, she would not face danger, he would do everything to save his friend. Even when injured, lying on the ground unable to stand up, he joyfully told her that he had made a necklace that could be paired together, with a beautiful gemstone, symbolizing the friendship between them. It was a reminder for both of them to think of each other, even when apart. From that moment, they officially became best friends. He gently explained to her the significance and importance of being best friends. At that time, Petty was so moved that she burst into tears of happiness, unable to hold them back. She had thought about revealing her name to the boy, but fear overtook her. Petty felt that if she revealed her name, they would never have the chance to meet again. She vaguely realized that their happy days were coming to an end, and they promised each other that next time they would reveal their names. But, there was never a next time, the person she longed to meet was now forever unreachable. After Karen left, Petty finally understood that the only person who brought her peace no longer existed in this world. Shiro and Aina felt deeply sad. 
Shiro asked Petty about her next intentions. With sorrow, Petty admitted she had no home to return to, she had been banished from her tribe. She also wanted to reveal to him that she was cursed, the mark on her abdomen among the fairies was seen as a harbinger of disaster. This was why Petty wished she had never been born. It was also the reason her parents abandoned her, yet somehow tolerated her presence in the village until now. But now, there was no one left, no place to accept Petty anymore. Long ago, there was a nest of gigantic beetles in the forest, their numbers dwarfing the fairies by thousands. They started to see the fairies as prey. Once the giant beetles began nesting, their population incredibly surged, and they would annihilate everything around them. Therefore, everyone started blaming Petty, claiming that the beetle infestation was due to her presence, and she should have left long ago. Shiro becomes furious upon hearing this, asserting that it's absurd to think Petty could cause the beetles to nest in the forest. Petty cynically laughs, perhaps she truly is a disaster. Her name, Petty Falulu, given by the tribe's chief in their language, means, the one who defies destiny. Ironically, it was he who first banished her from the tribe. It's a cruel joke that, after being ostracized, she saved Shiro, the fool about to drown, hoping he would help her find him. But in the end, she was the fool. Unable to hold back her tears, Aina tearfully calls out to Petty. Flying over, Petty touches her hair, comforting the little girl. After a moment of contemplation, Shiro asks Petty if she wants to save her tribe. He suspects she wouldn't care about the fate of those who exiled her, but Petty doesn't hesitate to say yes. She owes the chief a name, and her parents, friends are still in that forest. They might despise her, but they are her parents, her homeland, of course, she wants to save them. Shiro tells her that they will go and save the fairies together. Petty, tearfully, asks if he can really do it. Shiro answers with a determined look. They head to the Traveler's Guild, and upon presenting their request to NEI and some members, everyone seems quite surprised by the number of giant beetles. NEI understands the situation but can't accept their request, it's 200% unfeasible. Facing an entire army of beetles would require at least half of the guild's members. Shiro realizes the cost would be incredibly high, either in terms of money or manpower, depleting the guild's main resources. However, that's not all. NEI reveals that the travelers are currently engaged in searching for ancient relics. It would be a different story if the beetle nest was near Nino Rich. In short, the guild will not participate in this battle. Just as Petty was on the verge of walking away, Shiro called out to her, stopping her in her tracks. He proposed an alternative idea, suggesting that what if their approach wasn't a request but a mutually beneficial deal. With a fluid motion, he gestured to reveal his storage space, a dimension of his own making. This, he presented, would be his contribution. He proposed that once the guild located any ancient relics, he would employ his spatial transportation capabilities to assist them in moving their equipment. He was confident that this would significantly expedite their operations and compensate for the time spent in combating the beetle infestation. Ney's initial reaction was one of surprise and intrigue. However, she explained that she possessed a magical item, enchanted with space storage abilities, capable of holding up to three vehicles. Therefore, although Shiro's proposal was generous, it wasn't enough to sway the guild's decision. The conversation seemed to be reaching an impasse when suddenly, a deep, gruff voice resonated from behind. Erdos, with his distinctive voice, inquired about the situation that Shiro was dealing with. Upon Erdos' arrival, Shiro quickly briefed him about his plan, their objective was to annihilate the nest of giant beetles located in the eastern section of the forest. Erdos didn't hesitate and immediately accepted Shiro's request. Shiro, mixed with feelings of relief and concern, questioned Erdos about his readily given consent. Erdos reminded him of their earlier wager over drinks. Since he had lost the bet, he was obligated to fulfill a request from Shiro. Seeing Shiro's concern about requiring substantial manpower to tackle the beetle menace, Erdos robustly stated not to lump him with those youngsters. He boldly proclaimed that he alone was sufficient to dismantle the monster nest single-handedly. At that very moment, Lyre and Rolf stepped forward, having eavesdropped on the conversation. The members of the Azure Sky Group volunteered their assistance. Despite this, NEI stood firm on her position, refusing to give her consent. She stressed that accepting a request without the guild's sanction was illegal, 
and she was not prepared to let it slide. Both Erdos and Lyre remained unfazed. Erdos was merely acting on a promise from a bet, while Lyre was simply lending a hand to a friend. Furthermore, they asserted that they would not accept any financial reward for their involvement. Nesca chimed in, adding that if no reward was taken, then technically it wouldn't be considered as fulfilling an official request. Kilfa also joined in, voicing support for Shiro. Shiro was visibly moved by the outpouring of support from his friends and pledged to treat them to a celebratory drink once their mission was accomplished. As the members overheard talk of celebratory drinks, they stopped to inquire. Shiro responded that it would be the same drinks he had offered everyone a few days prior, and there might even be fairy honey wine. Upon hearing about this legendary beverage, everyone was overjoyed and eagerly wanted to join the battle. NEI was bewildered to see everyone abandoning their relic hunting duties, just then, the fairy Petty flew out, seemingly to add credibility to Shiro's words. She declared that she was the one who had made that particular wine for him. NEI, upon seeing the fairy, was confused about what was happening, thinking Shiro merely wanted to eradicate the giant beetles without understanding the deeper cause. Shiro had no choice but to explain to her and everyone else about the existence of fairies and the danger they were facing. He revealed that the fairy present, Petty, was actually his boss. In reality, she was the one who wanted to destroy the beetle nest because she wished to save her kin. Shiro, being an ordinary merchant, couldn't combat the monsters on his own. At this point, he bowed before Nei, pleading with her to save the fairy tribe. Petty, Moved to tears, also approached Nei to negotiate. If the guild agreed to help save her fairy family, Petty promised to make honey wine for each member. She too bowed her head in plea. Nei, rubbing her forehead with a headache, exclaimed that it was all too cruel. Shiro's actions made her feel like a heartless villain. She loudly ordered all members from bronze level upwards to prepare for the battle. Shortly afterward, everyone gathered at Jigaina Forest. Petty led them closer to the lair of the beetles. Due to the beetle infestation, the fairies couldn't leave their homes to gather food and were suffering from hunger and helplessness. A massive, ancient architectural structure, now occupied by the monstrous beetles, was discovered. Shiro told Lyre that this must be the ancient magical civilization relic the guild was searching for. Petty's chieftain had mentioned that this place used to be a cave, but long ago, an unknown species had constructed this edifice. NEI also thought this was a fascinating surprise. According to the plan to minimize casualties, everyone would be divided into three groups. Six Mithril-ranked individuals would form an assault team under Ney's direction, seventeen gold-ranked would stand at the gate to handle any bugs that fly out, and the remaining fifty-six silver-ranked would take care of anything that escapes outside. This was their technique for exterminating the giant bugs, and they could not afford any mistakes. NEI continued, arranging for Erdos of the Diamond Rank to be on standby in case the worst happens. Before she could say more, Shiro pointed to the figure of Erdos, who was leading the way straight into the bug's lair, leaving her speechless and wide-eyed in astonishment. The Radiant Heavenly group would stay behind to protect Shiro and the others. As the plan commenced, everyone followed Erdos into the lair to eradicate the monstrous bugs. The battle was fiercely intense. Shiro, Watching from outside and glancing at his watch, grew anxious after two hours had passed. Nei appeared at the cave's entrance, and Shiro immediately ran to inquire about the situation. Erdos also appeared shortly, laughing arrogantly, remarking that the youngster had underestimated him, it was just a morning exercise. Nei, standing beside, reluctantly admitted that Erdos single-handedly eliminated them all and she had confirmed no survivors. Shiro and Lyre were sweating in disbelief, relieved they hadn't crossed this man. Shiro asked about the presence of a boss bug inside the cave, but Erdos didn't seem too concerned about it, asserting that if there were one, he would have killed it himself. Since it took a lot of effort, Erdos turned to Fairy Petty to ask if there was any meat or even better, some wine. Shiro looked at her, wondering if they should meet the people who were saved and tell them that it was Petty who had saved them. Suddenly, Petty felt a headache and heard a call for help in her mind. She shook her head and asked Shiro if he heard anything, to which he replied he didn't. Remembering something, Petty swiftly flew towards the cave, shouting back that she would return soon. Without hesitation, Shiro followed closely behind, 
with Lyre just managing to call out to him before chasing after. Elsewhere, a tiny fairy was struggling to escape the clutches of a monstrous bug. Petty swiftly flew to the scene, responding to the call for help, and saw the little fairy trapped in the giant bug's pincers. She intended to use her wind-slicing spell to split the creature in half, but her rational mind stopped her impulsive act, realizing it would also harm the little fairy. With no other choice, Petty leaped onto the monster, striking it fiercely. However, without using magic, her strength was insufficient, and she was soon thrown off the bug's back. Shiro and the Radiant Heavenly group arrived just in time. Kilfa took Petty's place, climbing onto the creature and repeatedly stabbing it with a sharp knife, while Nesca used ice magic to shatter its massive pincers. Meanwhile, Petty rushed to catch the exhausted little fairy. But the situation worsened as more swarms of bugs appeared. Liars suspected there were many more coming out of the nest. The guild members also arrived, but the number of bugs was overwhelming. NEI was puzzled, perhaps they had driven the bugs out without completely eliminating them. Someone in the team suggested there was an escape route deep in the cave, obscured by the monsters. NEI realized her oversight and felt unworthy of leading such a team. But self-reproach had to wait as everyone's lives were in danger. Shiro came up with a plan. He asked Petty to stand in front of him, with a can of pepper spray in front of her, and a lighter ahead. At Shiro's signal, a temporary firestorm erupted, incinerating the swarm. The pair hadn't anticipated such an explosive effect from combining magic with modern technology. However, their triumph was short-lived as they noticed the Bug King still hovering and scathed. Shiro and Petty tried the same tactic again, to no avail. The Bug King drew closer, its sharp fangs poised to devour them. But before it could act on its vile intent, a lightning bolt struck it precisely, causing it to scream in pain before disintegrating into ash and dust. It turns out that Erdos had arrived just in time. He joyfully said that it had been a long time since he'd enjoyed using his magical axe, Sigal, which he had obtained from an immortal wizard. When Shiro, feeling a sense of familiarity, asked Erdos if this axe was related to true justice, Erdos confirmed it, leading Shiro to mention that his grandmother was also a fervent fan of Steven Seagal. Surprised, Erdos quickly turned to ask Shiro how he knew that person, and Shiro revealed that he was the grandson of Arisu Goemio. Erdos, realizing Shiro was related to her, remarked on the family resemblance. As they were talking, Petty was suddenly called by someone. Startled by the voice, she recognized it as the village chief's. Some fairies emerged outside, realizing the danger was over, leaving everyone in awe at the sight, a truly fascinating and unique scene. The village chief confronted Petty, questioning why she was there after being expelled and why humans were killing the giant bugs. Petty, unable to contain herself, shouted that she didn't need to answer these questions. Why should she, when she had been banished from the village? Sensing Petty's emotional turmoil, Shiro first greeted the village chief and then explained that Petty had saved his life, and in gratitude, he agreed to come and exterminate the turtle bugs to save the tribe. The village chief then realized they had been saved by Petty, the cursed one, a bitter irony that she returned to help. Nesca and others, curious about Petty's identity, listened as she explained that the village chief was referring to the mark on her belly, a sign of a calamity seed. Nesca recognized this symbol, known as the Crest, by the Wizard's Guild, appearing only on those born with a large amount of mana, a sign of the Chosen Ones. It made sense, as a large amount of mana can drive one mad, unable to harness its immense power, leading to the belief that those bearing this mark were destined for an unfortunate life. But this was a matter from long ago. The only way to control this power was to diligently learn magic from the basics. Those who could control this source of power would possess an astonishing amount of mana, becoming a great wizard, also known as a master wizard. Nesca continued, explaining that in remote areas, some races still misunderstood and discriminated against those with the crest, but it was not something to be shunned. Instead, it was a proof of one's exceptional abilities. Having learned all the basics at the Magical Academy, Nesca offered to teach Petty everything she wanted to learn to help her control her power. If someone with the crest like her learned to control mana at will, it would be a great help to the fairy tribe. The village chief, upon hearing this, could hardly believe his ears. The theory he had been taught since childhood was entirely wrong. Accepting his mistake, 
he bowed and apologized to Petty for all the hardships she had endured until now. He wanted to apologize both as a village chief and as a grandfather. Moved, the village chief fell to his knees, weeping. Petty also cried, quickly running to take his hand, saying that if she hadn't been exiled, she wouldn't have met Shiro and couldn't have saved the village. Therefore, it was the right choice. He and everyone were very kind, no one did anything wrong to her. After the battle ended and everyone returned to their homes, Petty followed Shiro back to his shop. But she wouldn't stay long, the village chief said she would return to the village, and Petty agreed. Aina, knowing the fairy was about to leave, cried bitterly. But Petty didn't want to live with humans anymore, their lifespans were too short. If they passed away before her, she would be unbearably lonely, the price of longevity. In the end, Petty only came to this city to find someone. Now that this person was no longer there, she had no reason to stay. Just as she was about to fly away, Karen's voice stopped her in her tracks. Karen found a letter among her ancestors' belongings, seemingly a letter from her great-grandfather to his dear friend, now handed to Petty. The fairy took the letter and opened it. Neatly written inside were the words, To my dear friend, it's been a long time since we last met, longer still since I promised to see you again, but countless seasons have passed. The thin arms you used to tease me about are even thinner now, and walking has become harder for me. But I truly wish I could run through the forest with you again, as we used to do. I heard from someone that fairies live much longer than humans. You did tell me your name, Petty Falulu, a very lovely name. I've whispered it many times while writing this letter. My name is Aaron, Aaron Sankaraka. Thank you for meeting me, Petty Falulu. Sincerely, your friend, Aaron Sankaraka. That was the entire content of the letter Karen's great-grandfather had sent to the fairy. Karen believed that her ancestor must have been greatly helped by Petty. The fairy, unable to hold back tears after reading the letter, realized his name was Aaron, feeling less alone knowing he knew her name too. They were each other's only close friends. He later fell in love, had children, and his grandchildren must have always been around him. He was very happy, so she should be happy for Aaron too. Shiro, seeing her cry, comforted her, saying that although human lifespans are short and their time together was not aligned, the way they thought about each other transcended time. Aaron would live forever in Petty's heart, an unchangeable fact. And though their time together might not be long, he hoped that he and Aina would also live forever in Petty's heart. He then took out a photograph from his pocket, featuring all three of them. To others, it might seem like they were just close friends, but the smiles on their faces measured the joy of their moments together. Aina couldn't hold back her tears, considering Petty perhaps her closest friend, along with Lyre, Nesca, Kilfa, and Rolf. Especially Nesca, who could empathize with Petty's feelings, as she too had fairy blood in her veins and would live much longer than humans. But even so, Nesca wasn't afraid to love Lyre, cherishing every precious moment they spent together, a choice she had made for herself. What about Petty? That was for her to decide. Tearfully, Petty made up her mind. She wasn't worried, the village chief hadn't specified when she needed to return, and besides, Nesca had promised to teach her magic. She couldn't leave Aina alone, the girl was still very young. So, Petty decided she would return to the village after erecting a gravestone for Shiro. Hearing this, Shiro silently hoped she wouldn't kill him right then and there, while Aina joyously hugged Petty, glad she was staying. Thus, the curtain fell on the adventures of Fairy Petty. Two months flew by, and the Harvest Festival was upon them. Shiro, having promised Karen to make the festival a grand success, turned Aina into a photographer with his camera. Meanwhile, Shiro and Karen held an auction. The first item was a legendary bottle of Spiritus, known as the Hero Slayer, and had taken down a famous hero, bought by a gentleman for 44 silver coins. The final product of the day, a drink that only those favored by the fairy tribe could consume, was fairy grass, put up for auction, crafted by a true artisan and newly appointed tourism ambassador of Nina Rich, Miss Petty. The starting bid for the fairy grass was one gold coin. The crowd below was noisy, with more and more people raising their bids, marking the auction as a resounding success. After it ended, Shiro sat with Karen and Petty beside the square. None could keep a straight face in front of the enormous sum they had made, a hefty fifty gold coins. Thankfully, Nino Rich had established a bank just in time. Karen thanked Shiro, 
attributing all their success to his efforts. Shiro humbly brushed it off, suggesting that the real thanks should go to their boss, who was the creator of the revenue-generating item. However, Petty, not dwelling on that issue, asked a rather awkward question that made both Shiro and Karen blush. She inquired if they planned to have children, suggesting that humans are always reborn and perhaps their child could be a reincarnation of Eren. Both Shiro and Karen, embarrassed and flustered, denied it, explaining that humans go through many stages before marriage and having children, or that children are the result of love challenges between a man and a woman. Their stammering response frustrated Petty, who loudly told them to be quiet. Just then, Aina and her mother came to Shiro's rescue. Today, Aina had taken many photos, and they had many customers. Shiro invited her to join everyone for a group photo. Although there were no bright lights, lanterns softly illuminated the darkened town. This was Nino Rich, the small town created by Aaron. As Shiro prepared to take a picture, Petty's funny pose made him laugh so hard that he couldn't press the shutter button. Suddenly, a woman's voice called out to Shiro, and when he turned around, he saw an unfamiliar face. Confused, he scratched his head, unable to recall ever meeting her. The woman then revealed that she was Shiro's grandmother. Remembering what Karen had said before, Shiro was shocked. His grandmother, not only alive but also present at the Harvest Festival. His greatest wish since starting his adventurous business life was to see his grandmother again, and it had been two months since he spoke of this. But in the meantime, Shiro had been attacked by a giant bug, and Petty had saved him from danger. It was an important encounter, and many things had happened until the Harvest Festival. And now, amidst the festival celebrations, a woman claimed to be Shiro's grandmother. Aina was puzzled, as the woman looked very young. The woman then stepped closer to Shiro, showing a family resemblance. But Shiro was still in disbelief. How could an 80-year-old grandmother look like a young, trendy, and beautiful girl like her? It seemed impossible. Contrary to Shiro's disbelief, Karen was quite embarrassed to meet an old acquaintance. Mrs. Arisu inquired if everything was all right with the young mayor, and Karen responded that this year's Harvest Festival was a resounding success, all thanks to Shiro's efforts. Mrs. Arisu seemed very pleased with him, saying that Shiro had grown into a good man, deserving of the effort she put into taking him to festivals since he was young. At this point, Shiro finally recognized that the woman in front of him was indeed his grandmother, but he still wanted to confirm more about her film preferences. Without hesitation, Mrs. Arisu mentioned that her second favorite film is Braveheart, but she would say Mad Max, and her favorite actor is Mel Sama. Finally, Mrs. Arisu expressed sadness at her grandson's doubt about her identity, recalling an incident when Shiro, at seven years old, had wet his pants after a movie, and she had to change him. Shiro, embarrassed, closed his eyes tight. The important thing was that his grandmother had disappeared from this world without a goodbye after so many years, and now appeared here, how could he believe it? Mrs. Arisu looked down, feeling guilty for making her grandson sad, hoping he wouldn't look so sorrowful. Petty, pointing at the woman, asked who she was, sensing immense mana energy from her. Karen quickly introduced her as a living legend, the immortal witch Arisu Gawamio. Just then, a crowd appeared behind them, having heard about the immortal witch's appearance. It was surprising that Arisu had reappeared this year. Everyone was pushing and shoving to get a glimpse of the famous face. Mrs. Arisu, used to such situations, seemed to realize she might not be able to enjoy the festival anymore. Just then, a sword was drawn and plunged into a magic circle. Someone recognized it as Mel Gibson's magical star sword. Mrs. Arisu, without saying much, pointed her weapon at the crowd, instantly causing them to collapse unconscious. Shiro, astonished, wondered what his grandmother was doing. Mrs. Arisu explained it was just an illusion, then hugged Shiro tightly, ignoring his screams, and flew towards a gap in the sky, heading home. When Shiro thought he and his grandmother would crash into the roof, another spatial portal appeared, and they passed through it, landing gently in a room. It seemed gentle for Arisu, but Shiro lay sprawled on the floor, frothing at the mouth. After regaining consciousness, they sat opposite each other, sipping tea. Arisu reminisced about Shiro's mischievous ways as a child, noting how he had now grown into a handsome and elegant man. Shiro had many questions for Arisu, first asking who she was and what her true identity was. Arisu puckered her lips, 
replying that she had already said she was a witch, wondering if that wasn't clear enough. Shiro rolled his eyes, asking her to act her age. He really wanted to know why she disappeared, recalling a major commotion at home the day Arisu vanished. Unfortunately, she couldn't answer that, as the water spirit world had many secrets and tasks to attend to. Shiro suspected he wouldn't get much information. Another question concerned Aina's youthful appearance, which resembled the illusion created earlier. Arisu revealed that her current appearance was her true face, the old visage in the picture was just a magical disguise, as living in her world meant her face didn't age with time. To dispel Shiro's doubts, Arisu transformed into her wrinkled, elderly appearance. Shiro's reaction went from astonishment to horror, begging her to change back, finding it too overwhelming and terrifying. Arisu also reminisced about Shiro's grandfather, praising his compliments about her youth and beauty. She fondly recalled intimate moments, with him holding her blushing face and kissing her. Shiro quickly covered his ears, shaking his head, not wanting to hear about his grandparents' personal stories. Arisu smiled and asked if he had any other questions. She then suddenly remembered her late husband. When they were building their home together, Arisu and her husband Marisu were completely destitute. They didn't have the funds for travel or a honeymoon during their free time. It was then that Arisu came up with an ingenious plan. They searched for an empty room, and Arisu used her powers to connect a wardrobe to Lu Falcio, a magical world. There, they indulged in endless adventures, they tamed wild beasts, climbed the colossal world tree, and even chastised a foolish king for his inept rule over his kingdom. The two unique skills that Shiro currently utilized were a product of Arisu's exceptional abilities. She had created them by separating herself from the constraints of worldly logic. But her powers were even more extraordinary than that. She could hurl a volcano through the air, command the dead with a forbidden spell, and even had a magic powerful enough to split heaven itself in two. Arisu offered Shiro a choice of these immense powers, as a gift from his grandmother. It was entirely up to him to decide, and she promised to sit with him until he made his decision. Shiro was initially overwhelmed by the offer, not expecting to have such an opportunity to spend more time with his grandmother. Deciding to cherish this moment, he resolved to prepare sukiyaki, her favorite dish. They would enjoy the meal together and toast to their unexpected reunion. The following morning, Shiro traveled back to his shop through the spatial portal that bridged the two worlds. He felt a sense of relief that the wardrobe provided a direct connection to the second floor of his shop. He was planning to go and apologize to everyone for his sudden disappearance the day before. However, he was startled when Aina, standing behind him, reacted with surprise to his sudden emergence. In a stuttering voice, Aina called out to him, and he turned around in shock to see Petty there as well. It was clear they had witnessed him coming out of the spatial rift. Shiro, sweating under their scrutinizing gaze, was about to come clean about his actions when Aina and Petty, driven by curiosity, asked him if he had just returned from a land of witches. Shiro, increasingly bewildered, realized that after he vanished, they had scoured the entire town looking for him. Petty had even speculated that he might have been teleported by a witch to her country. Realizing that he could no longer keep the truth from them, Shiro admitted that he had indeed visited his grandmother's house the previous day. The place Arisu took Shiro to was far, very far, yet accessible in an instant through her magical transportation. Hearing this, Aina and Petty's eyes sparkled with curiosity, urging Shiro to describe what the witch's dwelling was like. Shiro, fumbling for words and feeling overwhelmed by their eager faces, vaguely mentioned that the atmosphere there was quite different from Nina Rich. Before he could elaborate, the girls excitedly jumped, concluding that Nesca's stories were indeed true. They continued to press Shiro for more details. As he tried to back away, evading their curiosity, he accidentally slipped on a banana peel someone had carelessly left on the floor, tumbling down in a heap. Aina and Petty seized the opportunity to bombard him with more questions. At that moment, Karen, Emil, and Rolf burst into the room. The scene they encountered was quite a spectacle, Aina perched on top of Shiro in a rather intimate pose. After spending some time clearing up the misunderstanding, a sense of calm finally returned to the group. Karen expressed everyone's concern for Shiro, admitting her own mistake in revealing Arisu's identity and acknowledging her carelessness. Rolf inquired about Arisu's current whereabouts. 
Shiro replied that his grandmother had simply mentioned she would return soon before disappearing, but he guessed she would reappear before long. Karen speculated that Arisu might attend next year's harvest festival. With Shiro's efforts, the upcoming festival was expected to be even grander, attracting nobles and even members of the royal family. However, that was a concern for the future. At present, Karen had responsibilities as the mayor. She had to collect taxes for Count Bahua, the lord of the region. Everyone in the territory was obliged to pay these taxes, which she, as the town's representative, would personally deliver to the mountain lord. Karen seemed worried about this task, understandably, as people generally disliked paying taxes, and it could lead to dissatisfaction with the mayor. But there was another, more personal reason for her concern. Her expression turned serious, indicating she had something important to discuss with Shiro. Caught off guard and misunderstanding the gravity of the situation, Shiro awkwardly blurted out that he didn't have a girlfriend. Startled by Karen's reaction, Shiro realized she hadn't intended to confess feelings but rather needed a private space to discuss something else. They relocated to Shiro's living room, where he brewed hot tea for her. After settling in, Karen suggested they dive into the main topic. She hesitated, unsure how to express her long-standing concerns about Shiro. He was surprised, wondering what there was to worry about him. Karen's face turned even redder, too embarrassed to continue. Shiro's imagination ran wild, now firmly believing Karen was about to confess her love for him. As she grew more embarrassed, Shiro's anxiety increased. Karen started saying she had been troubled about something for a long time and wanted to talk to him about it. Shiro, also blushing in the awkward atmosphere, anticipated her next words to be a declaration of her long-hidden love for him, to which he planned to respond that he too harbored feelings for her. The room fell into an uneasy silence, neither willing to break it. Finally, Karen blurted out, asking why Shiro's hair was so shiny and smooth. Despite her diligent hair care, she couldn't achieve the same results. Shiro, stunned, touched his own hair in disbelief. Karen nodded, admiring the luster and softness of his hair, noting how it seemed to form a halo of light around him in the sunlight. Shiro jokingly asked if she meant like an angel's halo. Karen, in a mixture of envy and admiration, wished her hair could shine as brightly, especially for an upcoming event. Shiro, now curious, asked about the event. Karen explained that at the upcoming tax presentation, Count Bahua would host a grand party for distinguished guests, including mayors and village elders. However, she felt out of place at such lavish events, often feeling the scornful eyes of others who deemed her a simpleton from the wildlands. Additionally, there were no stores in Nina Rich selling suitable dresses for such an occasion, and she had no time to travel to the region's largest area, Mazera, to shop. Therefore, Karen expressed her wish to have hair as shiny and smooth as Shiro's, hoping it would at least prevent her from being looked down upon. Shiro understood her intention and agreed to help improve her hair, promising to make it even more beautiful than his own. She could use the same products he used for his hair. Karen was curious about what special hair care products were needed. Shiro also promised to prepare an exquisite dress for her, assuring her that she wouldn't be embarrassed, even at a royal ball. In fact, he promised to make her the center of attention, transforming her into a true lady. After parting ways with Karen, Shiro returned home that evening and began researching famous party dresses. Arisu asked him what he was doing, and Shiro explained he was looking for dresses suitable for a place like La Falsha. Misunderstanding, Arisu thought he wanted to change his dress style before she passed away. Shiro clarified that it wasn't for him but for Karen. Remembering the mayor, Arisu squinted and playfully asked if Shiro liked her, hinting that Karen had quite an ample bust. Shiro quickly corrected her, saying it was only because he had promised Karen. Despite Shiro's denial that it wasn't a marriage proposal, Arisu decided to find the perfect dress for the girl. Shiro was skeptical about his grandmother's sense of style, noting that she always wore an ugly, ash-gray outfit. Arisu coolly replied that she wore it to suit the situation and maintain a certain level of coolness. 